Slido. So if you've got the Slido, um, go to the Slido website or the app, put that code in, ask questions. That's so that the people online and in person can go, have a go. But also, if you'd rather hear, put your hand up and ask a question, please do so. The question's probably at the end of the talks, but obviously Slido, if you put them during the talk, that's fine. Um, the reason we're doing this event is to, um, it's because it's supported by the UK Space Agency to grow Cornwall and the capabilities down here, and we're looking at today at artificial intelligence and machine learning. And on that basis, Goon Hilly, who, uh, found, um, a fundamental part of the space cluster here in Cornwall, are starting to use artificial intelligence in their business as well. So what I'll do, I'm going to hand over to Ian Jones now to kind of welcome to the site, talk more about Goon Hilly, and then um, we'll take it from there. Over to you, Ian. Very good. Thanks, James. Well, first of all, thank you very much, everybody, for, um, for coming here. And uh, for those people that are joining us online as well, um, it, it's really great to, to be doing this hybrid event, which I must admit I'm normally quite nervous about. I, I think people who know me uh, think that I'm normally quite a calm person. But uh, <laughs> actually trying to do this um, dual mode, actually seeing people in real life um, uh, uh, and making this work online, uh, is, is, a, is a new thing for us. So you'll have to bear with us uh, if, uh, if there are a few glitches during the day, but uh, I'm, I'm sure we'll uh, all enjoy being here and, and, and seeing each other again. So um, I'd like to, to welcome you to, to Goon Hilly. Uh, it's quite a special place. This is our 60th birthday uh, year this year. Uh, 60 years since um, Telstar 1 uh, was picked up, the first transatlantic TV uh, pictures transmitted via satellite uh, and so we're, we're sort of building up to uh, a celebration in the summer for, for, for that. Um, I guess as, as, um, uh, as, as we always do on these occasions, I'll, I'll give you our, our quick health and safety uh, briefing as, as we need to do. Um, so obviously we're not expecting any um, fires or fire alarms or emergencies uh, today. So if an alarm does go off, we're going to meet out in the car park outside. Uh, there are facilities, uh, toilets, uh, and, and um, just, just outside of the corridor here. And, and we've got refreshments um, for you throughout the day. So um, I think that's all I need to say uh, as far as that's concerned. Uh, let me just give you a little, very short uh, introduction to, uh, to Goon Hilly. Uh, but before I do that, I, I think um, maybe, uh, Nate, if you could bring up, uh, we'll just say hello to Olivia. Um, Olivia has arranged this conference. Uh, Olivia's one of our, our engineers here at Goon Hilly. Uh, you can wave to us, Olivia. You're on, <laughs> on the screen here. Um, unfortunately, Olivia tested positive for COVID uh, on Monday. Uh, so she should have been here in person. Uh, but you, you're looking OK, uh, Liv. <laughs> I hope you're feeling okay. Uh, you, 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 you're bearing with it anyway. So, so um, Liv's going to do her her um, her talk uh, online. So we'll we'll speak to her uh, in, in a few minutes. But um, yes, yeah, so, so Goon Hilly is this extraordinary site. Uh, it's as it said it's in its 60th anniversary. Uh, it has been in public ownership uh, until about 10 years ago, uh, when it was going to be closed down and, and, and demolished. Uh, and those of us who are in the industry, uh, like myself, um, and I'll show you a rather embarrassing photograph in a second. Uh, not so embarrassing, but it's, uh, <coughs> you'll see, see what I mean. Um, we, we were a bit um, in consternation about the fact that it was going to close down. So, so I actually set up a, a company to, um, to rescue the site, essentially. Uh, and right now we have um, Goon Hilly 6 here uh, is uh, doing live operations for the European Space Agency. And again, maybe Nate, you could, you could bring up the live picture of, uh, of Goon Hilly 6. So th this is uh, from, from the Goon Hilly 6 webcam. It's actually pointing up above the North Pole at the moment, tracking um, a spacecraft called Integral. Uh, it's an X-ray observatory uh, spacecraft, which is in a very elliptical orbit around the Earth. It goes out to about twice the geostationary distance. And, and um, Goon Hilly is um, the only commercial ground station in the world providing this sort of deep space uh, communication service. Uh, and this antenna, originally built in, in the 1980s, 1984, 
uh, has been repurposed uh, with uh, financial support from Cornwall uh, and uh, on a uh, European Space Agency contract. And that's made uh, Cornwall uh, and Green Hilly the, the world's only private deep space uh, operator. So I promised the embarrassing picture. Here it is. Um, <laughs> Uh, not quite me uh, naked in the bathtub um, as, as, a, as a baby, but uh, it looks like me as a baby to me, really. Um, this is me uh, as an electronics engineer very early in my career. I designed uh, the satellite modem uh, up in a company in Yorkshire, uh, Alison. Uh, and um, uh, so I worked for a company in, in Yorkshire. Uh, and after I designed these circuits, I then came down to Goon Hilly to install them. Uh, and it was the world's first uh, satellite telephone system for aeroplanes. And there's a dish just behind the, the windows out there, uh, which was called Goon Hilly 7. Actually, it's no longer there. But we, one of the first things we did was put a new dish there. Uh, that was the dish that I worked on. And I used to come in here for my lunch uh, during, during the, the lunch breaks. Anyway, the reason I, I put this picture is not me being vain. It was because I was doing digital signal processing at the time. And uh, I was designing th this modem was using this new device um, ca called a digital signal processor. And uh, it wasn't until, uh, you know, I, I forgot all my engineering in the interve intervening time. Uh, but it was when we were looking at building a data center here uh, and I started to get interested in uh, high performance computing and, and AI. But I started to realize that all of the techniques in AI I'd done, goodness, 30 years earlier. Um, and uh, those techniques in, in digital signal processing uh, are, are very key. So you're going to have very interesting keynote speeches um, today from a few different people. And uh, you'll here that there's a theme of not only uh, data from space, but uh, using uh, radio astronomy uh, techniques. Uh, and I have a, uh, a brother who's a, um, a radio astronomer. He's a professor at, uh, at Oxford. And uh, we've had many conversations over the years. And again, there, there are techniques from radio astronomy, from digital signal processing that all impinge on uh, or, or are very close to AI. So this is, this is where our, our sort of interest came from. And just to, this, this is my, um, my, my simple explanation of, of how it all works. Some of you may have heard some music playing uh, while you're having your coffee. Uh, it was this music. It was uh, Nora Jones. Uh, she calls it One Flight Down. I call it the Correlation Song. I, I, I like songs which actually have a, have a meaning in them. So she says, uh, One Flight Down, there's a song on low and your mind just picked up on the sound. And you, you, know, um, you know, when you're in an environment and all of a sudden you say, oh yeah, I recognize that song. And she says, it's been there playing all along, and now you know. And this is what your brain is really good at. It's a matched filter. So when you realize you recognize the song, all of a sudden it, it comes loud in your, in your brain. You can hear it. This is what a correlator does. So the, the information is there all the time. But uh, the correlator is this matched filter, which all of a sudden picks out the fact that it's there. And then now you know it's there. So <coughs> my last slide. Um, what are we going to achieve today? Well, we want to be interactive. Certainly in the room, we want to be interactive. Uh, and with our audience who are live online, there's the opportunity to, to interact with, with Slido. So we'll be putting um, the, the reference to Slido uh, on so people can ask questions. So we want to try and be as, as interactive as we can. So I've already talked about, um, you know, are there science and engineering based algorithms you know, different, better uh, than, than, than AI for, um, and particularly for space data? We'd like to tease that out during the day. But more importantly than that, uh, how do we commercialize it? So uh, those, those are the themes that I'd like to sort of to, to really um, to, to work out today. So with that, I, I'm going to hand over to um, Olivia. Um, and uh, we'll bring Liv up. And um, Liv, if you'd like to um, give, give your, your presentation, we're, we'd love to hear you.
Thank you, Ian. Hopefully you can see my presentation right now and hear me okay. We can indeed. Excellent. Okay. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, it's unfortunate that I'm not able to be there in person and join you all today. However, I hope that you all have a fantastic day at Goon Hilly. Um, so, yeah, I'm Olivia Smedley. I'm a space scientist leading on the development of our Space AI Institute. And in this short presentation, I'm going to give a bit of background to satellite data AI, present the vision for the Institute and talk about an initial project. Um, so space data and artificial intelligence, uh, these two things go hand in hand. Um, currently, there are over uh, 4,800 operational satellites in orbit around the Earth, which is a vast number. And in fact, um, more than 900 of these satellites are specifically designed with Earth observation in mind which you can imagine is acquiring a, a vast amount of data every day. And a collection of these Earth observing satellites um, are, called, are called the Sentinels. Uh, the Sentinels are launched by the European Space Agency as part of the uh, EU's Copernicus program. And this program alone acquires around 12 terabytes of, of data each day. And what this vast amount of data allows us to do is to gain a really valuable insight, uh, not just on a global level, but also on a local level as well with the kind of ever increasing um, spatial res resolution of these satellites. And there's some examples here of um, recent cases where we've used satellite data. So for, for example, um, the eruption of the volcano near Tonga earlier in the year, um, we could observe from space and a little closer to home, um, we could actually observe the effects of, of storm units a couple of weeks ago using, as you see here in this bottom right image, the uh, rough waves hitting the uh, west side of the uh, Lizard Peninsula there. So, um, with this vast amount of data, I guess that it is really artificial intelligence that really allows us to actually unlock the potential of this, these big data sets. AI can uh, allow us to kind of find hidden patterns in data, uh, to make predictions about the future. And then we can use this information to actually kind of obtain action, actionable insights that, that people can use to improve services or infrastructure, for example. So today, uh, the focus is all around commercialization of space data and AI. So I wanted to get in a couple of examples of uh, commercial applications. So I've just picked a couple of sectors here. So starting with, with flooding, we can use space data to look at the extent of, of floods and predict perhaps in the future where floods are likely to to occur. So this top right image here is a flood at the end of last year, uh, which ha which happened in the US state of Washington. And actually satellite data um, could be used to look at the extent of this flood. So this this image here is a radar image uh, from the Sentinel ones. Um, that, that produce that image there and the, the flood extent is shown in dark blue. Looking at supply chains as well, there's a growing um, use of satellite data in, to inform the supply chains. Um, for instance, lots of companies now are committed to no deforestation in their supply chains and satellite data can help to um, address those commitments to no deforestation. For example, um, Nestle is actually using satellite data to look at um, its palm oil uh, in its supply chain. Uh, as well, we can also look at things like illegal fishing um, and uh, track fishing vessels, for instance, using satellite data. And finally, in, in agriculture, we can use um, 
satellite data to actually map uh, different types of crops and begin to estimate the, the yields that might be expected from those crops. So that's just a handful of examples of commercial applications. So focusing now on the Space AI Institute uh, at Goonhilly Earth Station. Uh, this is our mission statement here in a couple of sentences. And really what we want to do is to kind of bring together businesses and academia uh, to, to be a real hub for research and commercial applications of satellite data and AI. And as Ian has already uh, started talking about, we, we really want to look at kind of the combined multidisciplinary knowledge. So combining techniques and skills that are already used in radio astronomy and digital signal processing um, with Earth observation to improve the Earth observation applications and uh, therefore provide customers with unique products to solve problems both on Earth and in space. So um, talking a little more about the radio astronomy as aspect there, um, we have Goon Hilly 3 on site, which hopefully you'll see uh, on the tours this afternoon. Uh, Goon Hilly 3 has been upgraded for radio astronomy in collaboration with the University of Oxford. We've had a cryostat installed um, to bring the temperature of the receiver down to some very low temperatures. So we do have really strong links with the radio astronomy uh, community that we hope to explore further with the development of the AI Institute. So this slide is all about the, the foundations of our Space AI Institute. Um, we are in the early stages of, of development and actively um, looking for projects to get involved with. Um, and these are some of the unique elements of Goon Hilly that we kind of plan to build upon. So first is our Cougar partnership. Uh, Cougar is the consortium of universities for Goon Hilly astronomy. So uh, as mentioned, we have strong ties with the radio astronomy uh, university departments. We also have our data center with high performance supercomputing capabilities. And of course, we are a ground station, um, so we're able to directly downlink um, data from satellites uh, and feed that into our data center. And we already have customers on site in the Earth observation sector, such as, as Planet that we uh, have uh, antenna support on site for providing communications links for their satellites. OK, I'm now going to talk about an initial project for the Institute. And um, this is all about mapping tree cover in Cornwall using Sentinel data and supervised machine learning. Now, I will be talking about this in more detail in the fireside chat later on with Ian and Natasha. But just to give you a little brief overview now. Um, so firstly, why map tree cover? Um, well, uh, obviously, trees provided with a kind of nature based solution to climate change. And trees aren't only just important for kind of um, reducing the, the carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere but also for such things as reducing erosion. Um, they can provide cooling in cities, for instance, and also for um, providing habitats. Uh, in fact, the Cornwall Council has a scheme called Forest for Cornwall, which aims to uh, increase the tree cover in Cornwall by 2% by 2030. So for this particular project, I used um, the freely available Sentinel data um, and the platform called Google Earth Engine for actually accessing and processing uh, those data sets. So I uh, used actually Sentinel-1 and Sentinel-2 combined imagery, uh, which is both synthetic aperture radar and uh, multispectral imagery from Sentinel-2 to um, create my data sets. 
I then created um, a, my training data set with some known land cover um, areas across Cornwall and use this to train, um, train an algorithm. In this case, I use the random forest algorithm, which is kind of a well-known, well-used algorithm for um, land cover classification. Um, and I guess applying that across the, the whole of Cornwall, uh, running the classification across the whole of Cornwall, the output was this map bottom right here with lime green showing the areas of tree cover in, in Cornwall. And this goes down to around 10 metres in resolution as well. So through this study, I was able to find that I could map smaller regions of, of tree cover and within urban areas, which is um, perhaps uh, a, a benefit over other traditional base studies. Uh, that was all I was going to say about that project for the moment. I'm sure we'll go into more detail uh, later on. Um, that's all from me. Thanks for listening and any questions now? Any questions for Olivia? Don't have to. Right. No, brilliant. Well, thank you very much for Olivia. Um, OK, thank you. <clears throat> right. Cool. So guys can put it back in presentation. Brilliant. So next up, we've got um, Gavin from the University of Exeter. Um, he's a Turing Fellow as well, and he's going to talk to us about the uh, collaboration that University X has got with um, the Met Office. What the? Oh, thanks. Okay. Right, well, uh, thank you uh, for the invitation to speak today. As James said, I'm Gavin Chaddock, and I have uh, a number of roles. Probably the most uh, pertinent ones today are I'm co-director of a new, well, year old now, uh, joint research centre with the Met Office in Environmental Intelligence, and I'll explain what we mean by EI. Uh, I'm also a fellow of the Alan Turing Institute, where I lead on um, environment and sustainability. For those who don't know, I'm sure you all do, the Turing, Alan Turing Institute is the UK's national uh, data science and AI Institute. Point to that way. Um, I think most of this is, is well known to hopefully everybody that our interaction with the natural environment plays a crucial role in all aspects of society, our health, wealth, safety and future development and we really need to work out ways that we can interact with the environment sustainably going into the future um, across a number of uh, fields and sectors. What we do know uh, to help us do this is there's an explosion in the quantity of environmental data and a large uh, component of that comes from satellites and remote sensing, but also the ability using AI and data science to connect that with things like ground monitoring and sensors to calibrate uh, and therefore come up with some really high resolution uh, data products um, that can be useful across a number of kind of uh, outcomes, including, um, you can see some examples now, flooding. Uh, Olivia's presentation had a, a few other examples that I'll explore, hopefully, uh, in a bit more depth on predicting flooding, but also uh, looking at things like trees and how they can help reduce urban uh, heat, which is something we expect to become an increasing problem with climate change. So there's a, a, a real opportunity that uh, we have now, um, a unique moment in time in some sense, that we've got this explosion in the amount of data that's available, certainly from satellites, but also the development of AI techniques. Uh, Olivia mentioned random forests, things like neural networks, but also being able to do some more traditional techniques uh, that have been around for many decades, but at a scale computationally that we might not have been able to do in the past. So what do we mean when we uh, talk about environmental intelligence? Um, it's the integration of environmental and sustainability research and crucially data uh, with data science, artificial intelligence and cutting edge digital technologies to provide meaningful insight to address environmental challenges and mitigate the effects of climate change. Um, and a lot of the work we've done uh, at the Turing and in the Joint Centre has been um, we know, well, we, we, we have an understanding of what our environment and climate is now. We know that's going to change 
uh, with climate change? How can we help mitigate that? How can AI and satellite data help us, one, mitigate, so do something about climate change, but also how can we adapt to climate change? We've seen an increase uh, recently, three named storms within a month, um, and we see increased heat waves in the summer. I can't promise one this summer. Um, uh, so how do we adapt uh, to changes in the short term? So the opportunity, I think, is immense. We, have a, uh, we can transform our understanding of the complex interactions between ourselves and the environment. And crucially there, we need to take environmental data from satellites, from sensors, from monitoring, and integrate it with data from other sources. So economic data, demographics, uh, operational systems for things like energy networks or, or transportation. Um, a couple of things, again, uh, thinking about how we might use it. There's monitoring and tracking uh, environmental change. So looking at changes in tree covers, for example, looking at coastal erosion, and actually using satellite data and AI to detect where there's a kind of underlying shift. So not just daily changes, changes in fields going from green to brown and then back to green, but actually using historical data to actually predict where there is a real change, something has happened. Crucially, of course, what we really want to do is to look at the precursors to that and say there is something going to happen, that if we act now, we could stop that happening. Um, and also evaluating inventions. When we actually do things, what effects do they have? So um, can we assess whether a change in an air quality management scheme, for example, reduces air quality to the extent that we hope it will, but also in the right areas. And it doesn't have an unintended risk that you just make things worse, either in terms of the air quality or, uh, or water pollution um, in other systems. So it can be used, I think there's huge potential for taking satellite information, building data products and decision support uh, systems and helping uh, risk management. I suppose one of the ultimate outcomes might be able to run everything in a virtual world so you can try interventions, investment decisions uh, virtually and then see what the uh, results would be rather than testing them in, the real, in real life. Um, and I also think crucially we'll be using AI and satellite information in actually facilitating change itself. So not just monitoring and evaluating, but actually integrating it into energy systems, uh, transport systems, precision agriculture, uh, and other environmentally related systems. Now, I'm not sure uh, how you go backwards. I do now. Um, and just to mention, um, on a kind of global scale, the sustainability development goals I think are something that satellite information, data science and AI have a huge uh, amount <coughs> to offer. Um, the UNEP, United Nations Environment Programme, uh, estimate that of the 93, it might be 91, environmentally related SDGs, there just isn't data to evaluate 68% of the indicators. So there just isn't the information there. And I'll hopefully get time to give an example at the end of how we might use satellite data calibrated with monitors where they exist. Uh, to create some of those uh, indicators to track, hopefully, progress towards the goals. So um, we uh, have been thinking about um, EI solutions. So as we know, um, we uh, need to transition to a net zero economy. It means that business and governments will need access to decision critical information on the environment to well, survive and thrive, and often that uh, information is going to have to be closer and closer to real time, uh, and that's where I think we can really make the most of satellite information, but also processing that information using AI to come up with products that actually help people make decisions and, and react to changes in the environment. A brief word about the Joint Centre. So this is an initiative uh, set up between initially the University of Exeter and the Met Office. Um, we've, in our first year, uh, developed a number of partnerships, notably with the Alan Turing Institute and, uh, and some other um, collaborators. It really is designed to uh, focus at research at the interface of environment and sustainability research, data science and AI, as I've said. And we've got three main kind of pillars or programs. One is research, development, application. 
and we're very keen that the research we do is application led uh, and that's a large part of our kind of desire to uh, um, have partnerships with stakeholders and end users. Um, the second is taking what might be a, a research idea, it might be using aerosol optical depth to look at air pollution and then get a high resolution map um, across the city. Is infrastructure and data engine research, how do we scale that up? How do we make sure that actually we can work with large amounts of data, potentially using cloud computing, uh, and actually have things that work not just on my laptop where I get what the thing to work for one area of Exeter, but to scale that up for the whole of the Southwest or the whole of the UK. And, and very importantly, we have a, a, a remit to provide capacity building and skills development. Um, we're doing a course next week, actually, uh, for a company in Cornwall, which is a kind of introduction to machine learning um, with the idea that that first one will be a gentle, general introduction, hopefully gentle as well. Um, and then future courses can focus on actually the needs of companies uh, and users. If you're interested, there's our website, jcei.org. Um, as I said, we are a very porous uh, uh, center and we have already in the first year established a number of uh, collaborations, most of which the Turing is a special case have been based around individual projects. Um, because we're, trying, we're very keen to make sure that our kind of research on the AI and environment side is linked to um, what's needed uh, in different sectors and different areas. And just a few ideas um, about what projects we've been involved in, the kind of uh, um, skills and expertise we have across the two, two organizations. Uh, our kind of um, flagship project, which has actually uh, got multiple uh, sides and partners is the Climate Impacts Mitigation Adaption and Resilience Framework or CLIMA and the idea here is that we take um, hazards uh, in particularly those related to climate change and that might be increases in heat, it might be increased precipitation in intense periods in the in the summer for example in winter over climate change, it might be uh, changes in wind patterns and we map those to data sets from uh, related to exposure and vulnerability. So for example, increased precipitation is one thing, but actually then you need to put that through hydrological and flooding models to see where floodplains might develop over the next 20 or 30 years, where there traditionally hasn't been a problem, will there be in the future? If things are then exposed, how vulnerable are they? How vulnerable is a, a substation or a transport network? And crucially, what effect would that flooding a particular asset come through to the rest of the operational network. So some of the hazards we've been looking at, uh, largely based on UK CP18 uh, projections, have been urban heat, flooding, energy, which is particularly looking at potential for wind droughts and renewable energy drought and air quality. Um, heat, uh, it's interesting that um, uh, Olivia mentioned uh, tree covers in urban areas and cooling. One of the projects we've done with Bristol City Council has been to look at uh, the potential for urban areas to get hotter. And when you, when you first look at this, it looks great because you can go to Bristol for your summer holidays. Uh, however, it does mean that many of the buildings, schools, uh, workplaces are not designed for what might be commonly 30 to 35, maybe 35 degrees plus during the summers for extended periods of time. Um, what we did uh, with Bristol City Council was actually to look at uh, their building characteristics and what retrofitting could be or will might be needed to reduce temperatures to keep people uh, healthy and safe during the summer. And we built a online kind of dashboard app. Behind this, um, you can put in global warming levels for which are different climate uh, scenarios. So if we think it's going to be two degrees above pre-industrial temperatures, four degrees, um, and then it will then give some nice uh, graphics of what the maximum daily temperatures might look like in terms of change. In that case, that's our hazard. Our exposure is how exposed are different population groups, people who have to work outside, agricultural work, well, not in Bristol, obviously, um, but people who have to work outside, um, people who work in certain buildings, but also how can you cool people down? It might not be okay for some people to just open their window at night, air pollution, crime, noise, 
Um, so how can you actually reduce the temperatures in buildings? Uh, a second example um, is, uh, was done with the National Digital Twin Program to look at a climate resilience demonstrator, and this time focusing on flooding, uh, where our hazard was increased precipitation, um, which is projected uh, our rainfall is going to get more intense at certain parts of the year, and um, the potential for flooding may increase. Uh, we can see, I don't know how much of this, oh, it doesn't work anyway. Um, if you go to a copy of the slides, you can see that uh, going forward, up to about 2070, we're expecting much more intense periods of rainfall and thus potential for flash flooding. Uh, I think the number of days that are expected to be above 30 millimeters per hour, um, what was once every 10 years is going to become twice as often. Uh, and there's some other interesting metrics. But what we did essentially, that was our hazard. We put that through some flooding models uh, and in a area of Britain, um, which you may or may not be able to recognize. Uh, then we uh, looked at the potential for flooding and increased flooding in areas that don't already. And then our, we actually worked with three stakeholders, which was an, a uh, power network, telecommunications network, and a water and waste network to see what effect that might have on their assets. And crucially, what they wanted to know was, does everything happen at the same time? Um, and what are the kind of knock-on consequences? Also to mention um, at the Turing, one of Turing's um, kind of core themes going forward uh, is increasingly environment and sustainability. What can AI do to help us uh, transition to net zero? What can AI do in terms of mitigating climate change? But also how can satellite data and AI actually improve some of the kind of heavy lifting, the computation for climate projections and numerical weather? Uh, models. Um, there is uh, a large program uh, activity uh, across a number of the themes at Turing. Um, there's also uh, recently, about a year ago, we set up a, uh, it was either cross-program theme or a cross-theme program in environment sustainability to bring together expertise. And what we really want to do is take some of the technical expertise that's been developed in other sectors and kind of bring that to climate and environment um, uh, and also to develop uh, partnerships um, with many of the partners we've seen already. Um, there are a number of Turing Fellows, I think there are now over 100, of which I'm one, uh, working with the Turing on different areas, not just environment and sustainability, uh, across health, defence, uh, engineering, um, but a, a large number now are part of the Environment and Sustainability Group. And we also do have uh, a special interest group um, and if anybody's interested in joining, it is open. Uh, we've got over 400 members from across academia, public, uh, private sector organizations. Uh, its, its mission really is to identify new solutions to key environmental challenges, to provide a platform for knowledge exchange, and in particular from uh, AI specialists to engage with um, businesses and environmental so that actually there's some co-design in, in uh, new developments and also um, to facilitate the identity of environmental data science as a career path. So just some ideas of the projects, and I haven't really got much time to go through these in much detail. Um, maybe I'll focus on the ones that say satellite. Um, there is a project, a large project at the moment on bridging spatial scales, and this is new AI techniques to integrate satellite data on grids with monitoring data on the ground and low-cost sensors for various things that are at point locations. Uh, those sensors, of course, might well move around in time if they're strapped to someone's belt. Uh, much lower quality, maybe, than a well-calibrated monitoring network, but does potentially provide us with uh, extra information that we can integrate with our satellite information. Uh, another one that I think is particularly interested is looking at climate change and food security. Uh, integrating uh, crop and disease models with remote sensing and also potential changes in the climate to try to tease out how robust our arable crops are to changes in climate, uh, but also with a focus on what, inverted commas, new diseases might we have to cope with if we have a change in overall temperature and, and precipitation. Uh, there's another couple based on energy, uh, in particularly 
and I think this is increasingly important, making sure that our plans for net zero are robust to changes in the climate. So reliance on renewable energy, solar panels and things, um, great at the moment, but how robust are they to things getting much hotter? Solar panels like the sun, do they like heat quite as much? Uh, and the potential for mismatches or, or hopefully alignment between demand and generation. Um, I won't go over these uh, in too much detail, but we have a, a number of projects at the Turing which are more environmentally uh, focused, um, looking at satellite imagery and how to deal with clouds. Uh, this is, I think, a really cool one, uh, Arctic sea lice. I think it's called IceNet, which is actually using uh, neural networks to predict changes in Arctic sea ice loss and comparing those with um, large-scale, big computation numerical models, not trying to replace them, but actually seeing how we might reduce some of the computational load um, to allow things like uncertainty for quantification, which it is not feasible to ask someone to run some of these computational models a thousand times just so you can get an interval is just Im impossible computationally. Um, so how can machine learning interact or it be embedded in some numerical models, not to replace them and invent new physics, but uh, actually to supplement? Um, how long have I got, James? Uh, a couple of minutes. A couple of minutes, right. I will remember how to press the button. So um, just thinking about one example on air pollution, um, Air pollution is bad for us. WHO estimates uh, worldwide about 4.2 million premature deaths uh, attributed to outdoor air pollution alone. If you look at indoor as well, it's about 7.1 million. Um, over 90% of people the worldwide are exposed to harmful levels of uh, fine particulate air pollution, PM 2.5, very small, past natural barriers into our lungs, associated no, not just with respiratory diseases, but with cardiovascular disease, increasing evidence uh, of relationship with cognitive decline, dementia, and, and things like diabetes. There is a need for accurate estimates exposures to air pollution at global, national, and very local levels. Um, now, on the global scale, here's the problem. The dots are the locations of air quality monitors in the WHO's ambient quality uh, data, uh, air quality database. And as you can see, lots of them in Western Europe North America, increasingly China and India, but there are huge parts of Africa, South America, Southeast Asia, there just isn't any information. So how do you plan interventions? How do you even quantify the problem? How do you track uh, progress if there just is no information? So what we need is a way of filling in those gaps. You've, given where we are today, you probably go and guess how it's done. Um, we can use data from other sources uh, and primarily uh, in this case, it's from satellite remote sensing. We use aerosol optical depth, uh, which is basically seeing how much air pollution there is in the air very briefly by how, how much uh, light is um, uh, stopped from going to the, the satellite. Chemical transport models, these are, if we know where the emissions are of air pollution, you can run similar to weather models if you know the wind patterns things. The problem is you need detailed emissions directories, which once again are available in North America, Western Europe, but not in the areas of the world that we really need them. We can get land use information from remote sensing and satellites. Uh, we can put that in the model. We do need a way of joining them all together. And at this point, I'm going to say AI. Um, for anybody who wants a next level of technical details, it's, it's Bayesian hierarchical models, um, which have been around for decades, but have now been Computation, at least, we can run some of the sophisticated models, which actually have hundreds of calibration equations in them, and then optimizing those uh, is something that we probably couldn't do computationally 10 years ago, not on this scale anyway. And the result, uh, known as the Data Integration Model for Air Quality, uh, takes this map and produces that map over there. Um, now, crucially, we can produce estimates so this will be a combination, depending on where you are in the world, there will be a different weighting, whether it comes from uh, monitors or whether it comes from the satellites. Um, it borrows information, it kind of goes information transfer, not of data, but actually of the relationships between different data sources. And along with that map comes a map of uncertainty as well. Now, um, the good news is that uh, where we have lots of monitoring information, the uncertainty is very low. I think it's important to reflect the fact that in Africa, although we can estimate, 
the uncertainty associated with those estimates is rather larger. Um, and I'm pleased to say that this is now used to calculate one of the SDG indicators, which struggled uh, at this time. Uh, now it's um, possible to calculate those for each country. And also locally, um, we now have, we've applied this model on a higher and higher resolution uh, for certain cities so that you can actually uh, look at air pollution next to individual road networks. Uh, what we can't do is run it at that kind of resolution on a global model um, without, I would say, burning through some data centers and using more energy than we should be. Um, something I think increasingly we're going to have to think about in the future is it's not going to be okay to just throw huge data sets with inefficient algorithms uh, in the cloud. Um, but I think that that's something for the future that we will start to almost go back in terms of algorithms and computing. And like in the days where we had little processors with teeny memory uh, and we had to write code efficiently, um, I suspect that's going to become a skill that's increasingly important. Anyway, I'll end there. Um, if you are interested in more information, uh, the Joint Census website's here. If you'd like to play with some of our apps about how climate change might affect uh, your region, there's an app there. Its default is Cornwall. Um, uh, and then you can look at the changes in temperatures and other things uh, over different decades. And if you are interested in finding out more about the Envi Environment and Sustainability Group at Turing, uh, as I say, we're always welcoming new members um, and you can find out some more details there. Thank you. Brilliant. <laughs> Thank you very much. Now, um, we do have a couple of questions on the slide. I don't know if anyone's got some questions here as well. Um, but I'll start with, it's quite a technical one for me. So, I'll, right. But basically, says, um, are there any challenges you have faced with during data access and machine learning to training, revisit time of satellites, cloud coverage, and optical, EO, et cetera? Does that make sense? Can I read that? Yeah, go for it. <laughs> <laughs> it's the top one. <laughs> Oh, I've read the next question as well. Oh, okay, go um, So I think, uh, to summarise the question, I, I think it's have there had any challenges, really, in accessing and downloading satellite data, running machine learning, given the kind of issues maybe with retrieval times and cloud coverage and things? And the answer is yes. Um, I think uh, there's a lot of work going on in, obviously, what to do about clouds in satellites. Certainly in the air pollution work, uh, we're working with the group in Canada and the US who have tried to uh, work out a way really of replacing days where it's essentially a missing data problem where they, you just can't see anything and it's not okay to just kind of fill in the gaps with a straight line. Um, so the answer is yes. I won't get too technical now if that's okay. Yeah, that's fine. Um, the second question I think and linking into that is part of the problem and it's a great thing that there's 12 terabytes from Sentinel and enormous amounts of data from satellites we can use. But then as we get more complex algorithms and we do more sophisticated things, and if we're basically filling in those missing data um, and we're doing that with uncertainty estimation, so we, we, we fill in missing data, uh, we know that there are several different ways we could have filled it in essentially. Do we then run the next stage on all of those different possibilities? Well, in some sense, yes. And that's more and more computation. So I think the question was, where are we doing it? Are we using the HPC at Goon Hilly? Yes, that's the question. Uh, yep. The answer is no, we're not, uh, because we are very fortunate um, in our collaboration with the Met Office to have access to some fairly hefty computing. Um, at the Turing, most of the computation is done in the cloud uh, in collaboration with Microsoft. So they got a, a large gift from Microsoft in terms of Azure credits. Uh, and I think going forward, a lot of our work is transitioning from, well, not laptop, something bigger than a laptop to being done in the cloud. Um, but I think it's important that we realize that the cloud can act just like having a bigger laptop, but that's not the most efficient way of doing things. So actually formatting things in cloud-ready formats uh, and making sort of computation, again, isn't just brute force. Hey, someone's just given me a massive computer. I'll just run the same thing and it will do it quicker. Because increasingly, we're going to use bigger and bigger data and more complex algorithms. And at some point, you know, we do have to start thinking about all the energy we're burning 
We not, might not be burning it here, but it is being burnt somewhere in the world. Brilliant. Well, thanks very much. Okay, okay one question. Andy? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, can I just ask it? Yeah, go for it, mate. So I'm, I'm interested more in, so I'm Andy Williams, I'm the European Space Agency's Business Applications Ambassador for the Southwest. That's a mouthful. Um, <laughs> but my, my question's more related to your relationship with the private sector and how we can sort of look at commercial uh, applications out of a lot of the research and a lot of the things, the good things that are happening, probably through the JCEI, through, through the Joint Centre. Yeah. What's the, what's the way we, we can either spin out or, or generate commercial exploitation, commercial applications out of some of these things? Because I'm thinking, you know, the long-term sustainability of this needs to sort of drive yeah. commerciality out of it. So I'll go back to this one. Um, this was for Bristol City Council, but I think the kind of ideas would translate. There's an awful lot of information there. I think actually building data products that actually people need, which is, and that means understanding what the demand is, not just we do something and this is great, would you like to buy this? But actually I think, and making sure that we can distill that into something that actually fits into the operational systems or decision-making of businesses. So uh, an example might be in um, the, the flooding example, uh, taking all that data, there is a lot of work and a lot of research and a lot of expertise allows us to do this um, and actually then packaging that up into something which is flooding predictions uh, with uncertainty for certain areas, but making sure that that data is a form that someone could easily then map it onto their GIS of their electricity network or their water network. Uh, and I think that stage from what we can do and we can create data products that we can use for our research and to give one-off examples that i say jump probably leap actually to understanding what such a data project product would have to look like and be to actually commercialize and sell i think is something that you know as academia we need help with so, so hi kevin chris, chris roberts so so i've done some work with the training institute and i know that for some of these projects, I guess, like this one we funded for a pot of cash somewhere. Yeah, so the um, hopefully I, I did put the logo on. The, the Bristol one was funded under the UK Climate Resilience Programme. Um, to do, I think the thing, I, sorry, I'll wait for your question before I try to no, answer no, 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 it. I think, you know, I think you've kind of answered it, really. I mean, I, I, I mean I, I'm thinking of the work that you did with Shed around uh, improving the, the, you know, the, the efficiency of ships kind of moving yeah. through the water by changing paint. Yeah, well, that was Shell. Okay. Paid, Shell, mm. Shell paid for that, right? Okay. As a, they paid for some research. They had a, um, you know, a scientist who worked on that project. Yeah. So I think the challenge is, and, and, and you know, that's more of a statement than it does any question, is making sure that you have a very clear commercial objective and that's yes. aligned with the academic research. Yeah. And I think in, in this case, sorry, we're probably going over time a lot. You know, this was a, a single project that we did with a block of funding and we did it and it worked. And I think too often that's where things end without thinking, well, actually, if it worked in this area, could it work everywhere? And then how can you commercialise that? How can you do it at scale? And that's often where we academics stop and it needs someone to take it on. Well, that's a great okay. example where if you can get some yeah. big fish to get involved, you know, like Shell, that's, that's really where you can yeah. really drink. We're going to have to wind this up. Any questions, further questions if you go grab Gavin just at lunch break? But yeah, really interesting. So thanks very much, Gavin. Thanks. <clears throat>
we're running a little bit behind because obviously there's more questions and stuff. Catch, but yeah. that's the whole point of the day. Um, so yeah, now we've got the fireside chat, which we've got um, two people in person and one and Olivia, who's obviously you've seen before, she's going to be remotely done. So yeah, it's going to be a fireside chat about how astrophysics techniques are similar to artificial intelligence, and it's round the trees to the stars is the uh, title. So Ian, over to you. Let's move then. We don't necessarily need that backdrop, I think. We'll oh, we're, we're, we need, we're going to have Olivia in a sec, I think. <laughs> so, um, well, you've, um, you've all met uh, me, and you've all met Olivia already. Um, this is Natasha Stephen from uh, University of Plymouth. Uh, Natasha, do you want to tell us a uh, little bit about what you do? Sure, thank you. Thank you, Ian. Thank you very much for the invite thank today, for Olivia, too. Um, so I'm Natasha Stephen, I'm the Director of an Analytical Mycroscopy Facility at the University of Plymouth, which uses a variety of the electromagnetic spectrum to investigate samples that have been returned from space, directly and indirectly. Um, so from my personal perspective, I'm a planetary scientist, a geologist by training, not an engineer or a physicist. Um, but we handle big data in lots of different ways, so obviously interpreting satellite and space-based data, but also generating a huge volume of um, analytical microscopy data as well. So it's now very routine to generate terabytes of data overnight in a microscopy facility, so we are really getting to the point where we're handling data sets that are comparable with the satellite applications data sets, which I used uh, much earlier in my career. Very good. And I think it, it's really good to, to, um, to have just heard from Summit. Uh, and those examples, um, th those astronomy examples, because just coming back to the theme, uh, you know, the, the, the twin themes that I, I set out at the beginning of, uh, you know, which algorithms should we use? Should should we um, should we use the the machine learned algorithms, or should we go, go back towards the, the physics um, uh, based algorithms? And and then not forgetting. The you know the real purpose that most of us are, are here and it comes down to money, uh, and uh, you know how can can we actually do anything which which is commercially um, capable and and, and can, can make some money? So this um, the the idea of this this discussion that we're having now uh, was was born out of Olivia's work uh, on her classification of trees, and uh, we had a bit of a discussion afterwards about the. Uh, the methods that uh, that she used, and uh, uh, and whether there were some some other techniques. So, um, Olivia, you mentioned uh, briefly previously that you used the Google Earth engine and the random forest technique. Uh, how did you find that in terms of the the accuracy of the the results? And um, you know, what what did you learn about the false positives and the false negatives? Okay, yeah, so um, hopefully you can ho all hear me. Um, yeah, so I use Google, Google Earth Engine as a platform for actually completing the classification. And yeah, as you say, um, the random forest algorithm, which is a well-known algorithm that's com commonly used for um, land cover classification and is available to use in Google Earth Engine. So um, I, I also tried um, other um, machine learning uh, techniques as well for classification as and even tried some unsupervised classification techniques firstly in my kind of trial and, and error phase but uh, the random forest algorithm is what came out as as the best one in this case and it did um, deliver a very accurate map overall um, the confusion matrix came out with around 97 percent um, accuracy which um, it is known to take that with a bit of a pinch salt though and actually the um, visual validation of the data set is the obviously the important part because it's it's what relates to the ground truth so um i did kind of a random sample uh, across cornwall and um with kind of 100 different random sample points and that came out as around 96 percent accurate on that so um it did produce very good results and as i kind of alluded to earlier um, it was it was good at picking up on even individual trees and, and smaller areas of trees. However, um, there were areas of misclassification, uh, as you could say, and these were kind of found to be in uh, 
kind of shadowed areas, perhaps around the, the coasts, uh, which for some reason came up as, as trees in those areas. And, but also probably the main thing is kind of misclassification um, of uh, other areas of vegetation and it misclassified those areas of trees, so areas where there were crops, it would say, uh, would trees in, in some small areas. So um, I guess this is down to kind of the overlapping of different spec of, of the kind of spectral signatures of those types. Um, green vegetation is is similar to trees in in a in a lot of ways uh, and can look similar in these kind of Sentinel two images. Maybe not to the human eye, but the actual kind of uh, numbers on those pixels uh, overlapped, causing confusion for the classification. Um, so yeah, they were the main areas of of, of confusion. Yeah, and, and I guess as with most things in life, we learn most and most quickly from the the, the, the errors. So so the, the the false positives and the false negatives. Uh, do, does that sort of relate to, to your work, um, Matt? And and, uh, and uh, uh, is that the technique that you use to improve re results? Absolutely. Yeah, I think for for my perspective. The, one of the biggest challenges we have is not the human versus the AI. It's the it's the translation of what the human wants from the AI. Because I often find in my field, we think um, spacecraft data coming from long rovers or from satellites, and those data sets can be interpreted in a number of different ways depending on what you want to get out of it. So you can get exactly the same uh, signal spectrum to a geologist, and they'll interpret that very differently to how a physicist would interpret it because they're trained in different ways, and they can take very different interpretations from the same data set you extrapolate that up to a much larger scale where you've got hundreds of thousands if not millions of data points and the way that you're designing an algorithm to develop that for you it's only going to learn from the processes and the input that you're giving it so if i'm asking it to do one thing and the physicist is asking it to do another they don't necessarily converge in a constructive way that doesn't mean that it's totally useless but it does mean you need to understand what it's been asked to do in order to be able to benefit from it and i tend to find it you know people to people talking from different areas really uh, interesting conversation about the same data set because they wanted something different and therefore they found something different. So uh, it's, it's a concern of mine when we talk about these sort of algorithms and machine learning that there is a translational error. We know that these things are full of both intentional and unintentional bias, but I think it's a translational issue as well. Mm, indeed. Uh, so um, I want to open this up um, to, to um, for you to join in our, our fireside chat. I'm not sure what the fire is at the moment, but... Uh, um, so, so have a think about that in, in a sec. But it would be interesting just to have a show of hands, just just um, so that you're all aware. You know, those people, uh, for example, from from academia and industry and, and others. So, so who's here from academia and from industry and uh, any other? People who would not classify themselves as academia or industry, yes? <laughs> <laughs> what would you classify yourself as? So, so um, yeah, so, so um, you know, that, so we're, we're moving, um, you know, we, we want to try and move this conversation towards, um, you know, how we can start moving from the collection of data and the processing data into the, uh, into the, essentially the monetization of, of of, of the results of these processes. But, uh, so have a think about that. You can ask those questions. Um, I just want to ask the question about, we've heard a lot about big data and these huge data sets. But going back to that uh, picture of uh, Ian in the 1980s, um, you know, we, we were, the, the name of the game then was, um, you know, we had to uh, do the digital signal processing on that signal with a, a five megahertz um, clocked microprocessor or, or digital signal processor. I, I had 500 instruction cycles of machine code uh, in which I could write my entire program. Uh, and it worked on real time data. So, and yet we were still doing filtering and, uh, and uh, correlation uh, within that, that very, very small uh, number of instructions. Uh, uh, on, on, on real-time data. So do we, do we need large data sets 
or is there a crossover point? Is, is there a point at which, for, for large data sets, it, it's, it's better to use one particular type of algorithm, but for, for a, 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 a real-time smaller data set, you do something different? Uh, so for, for my personal research and what I'm doing as an individual rather than as a representative of my facility, uh, we kind of go from, we boast that we go from the nano to the astronomical scale because we are looking at things at a nanoscale resolution in an instrument, but we are applying them to a, you know, a solar system body or an extrasolar body potentially. Um, so I think I'm a big proponent of in the lab, we don't have to do something just because we can and just because we can doesn't mean we should, because I think we do get into this point where we're generating huge data sets for the sake of generating huge data sets. And actually, we don't necessarily have the computational power available day to day to be able to deal with a lot of these data sets, which can be really problematic. And also, I think there's a there's a, a sampling issue as well, where you can oversample something, no matter what it is you're looking for. What amount of data do you need to answer the question that you're asking? And what else is superfluous to those requirements? Because I think coming back to one of the earlier talks about environmental sustainability, it costs a huge amount of energy to generate some of these data sets and to store these data sets and to process them in terms of the computing power and the capacity, which isn't av available to every individual, but you know, nationally and internationally, that, that can be a really big problem. So I think we do have a personal responsibility to ask those questions. Is, do we need to do this? And do we need to go that far with it? So just because I can generate something, on a nanoscale doesn't mean I'm going to gain any more information by doing so other than prove that I can. And I might have been able to answer the question, you know, five terabytes ago, and then why am I doing it? Mm. Because I can, and probably because that's what the funders want, and that's how I get funding, which I think is part of the issue. Mm. But, uh, but yeah, I quite agree. I don't think okay. it's always necessary. Very good. Let's open it up. Any questions out there? Alison. Hi. Um, so I think what we've been looking at this morning is, is just tiny snapshot, uh, my, my field is AI, tiny snapshot of um, what can be done. And it's also a very fast paced um, field. So we um, rarely use random forest for anything more than what it was originally designed for, which is for the basic um, time series. There are new methods and more and more efficient methods being, being made almost every week. And it's, it's part of my job to, just to try and keep up with it. And it is really, really insane. Um, it is a huge, huge um, problem with, and something that you know, I'm personally um, very aware of, about how much data is um, being generated, but how you're going to compute that. But it really comes down to so exactly what you were saying, um, in that it's the objective. What exactly do you want this AI system to do? If it's you know, searching for, for asteroids um, and, or asteroid trails, then it's really hard to, to find bias because obviously mm. you're looking at, um, you know, potentially, I think they were looking at 40,000 images. The bias in the way that, um, that Samet was talking about is human error. Yeah. But that's because they're using this fantastic resource, which, you know, which is Zooniverse, which crowdsources um, whatever, I can't remember the figure, 14, 12,000 people, I think, um, non experts to cut through all of that map. And then you bring the experts in to look at it. And I think it was, what, 10 years ago, um, Brian Cox was um, one of the, the, the large, um, was he in Kenya or Manchester? I can't remember. Yeah, Sheffield. <laughs> yeah, Sheffield. Um, and basically, they, you know, they did a, a universe um, project, and they found something like 12 unknown galaxies. Now, you take those 12 and then hand it to the expert. The point I'm making is um, I have to, you know, talk about this argument every week. AI is a tool to help us do a better job. And um, depending on the application, you know, if, for example, you're looking at an entire, you know, solar system um, data on air, it can reduce that, it can compress it to something that we can cope with, you know, because we can't possibly look, you know, at all the Hubble space telescope, yeah. um, you know, to see the images. But, but often it's a ma matter of having the the right domain of measurements, if you like. So, so you know, there we were looking at you know streaks across the sky and trying to decide what what that was. If you had spectral data for for that information, you'd be able to tell instantly, you know, just on a single pixel. That's the human aspect of it, you know. But yeah. Putting a human with AI, yeah. and especially cross discipline, I'll, I'll talk about this after lunch. Bringing together the experts on both, you know, let's say um, academics. 
management side and industry side, but also the expert in those individual fields, you know, your expert in, in your um, particular field, and then you've got your colleagues that you tell them to do. Bring all that into, you know, the, the, the situation. Her application is really key. Not just AI thinks it's going to solve this. That's ridiculous. Mm -hmm. uh, it takes a huge amount of human people. You know, we've, we've written all of the algorithms, for, you know, for a start. We have to build the data centers, even if it's, you know, just a fist of laptops. But it's AI plus human, and that's where you get rid of the majority of the bias. Mm. Indeed. So, um, th thanks, Alison. In, in, the, in my previous question to you, uh, you know, there's, a, there's about a quarter academics, three quarters um, uh, industry people. It would be interesting to know of you all, um, if you're an academic, do you have industry partners and, and vice versa? So how, how many of you cross the boundary in terms of having partnerships between and um, would any of you like to comment on on those sorts of relationships and um, uh, and you know, where, 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 you know I'm putting you on the spot here but, but you know, is, 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 is there are there things that we could do better in terms of, of building those relationships uh, what, what works what doesn't work uh, maybe I should, uh, I should put you on the spot first <laughs> The natural progression is using a lot of private sector funding to get further technology development and using uh, a week of these applications. So I think private funding is inevitable um, and therefore necessitates that kind of industrial collaboration. Um, aside from that, I think we've had, a, we've had success with a small number of uh, smaller partners who have wanted to utilise resources at the university, maybe that be equipment or academic or technical expertise, and that has been really, um, really beneficial both sides actually because we've gained a lot through the knowledge exchange between the academic and the more industrial um, environment and unfortunately i can't go into detail because i'm mm. under NDA. Yeah, yeah. but um but yeah but i think there's a lot to be a lot to be gained there and there's a, there's a huge wealth of experience outside of your own area and i think you know alison as you were saying you, you become an expert in the one thing that you're doing and you have to make sure that you don't become blinkered by that because mm. you're going to learn so much more by collaborating with other people no matter what the whatever the subject matter is yeah. and unfortunately for academics i think you know we need funding, yeah. <laughs> so we we have to we have to work with these external partners. I'll come to you in a sec, Alison. Yes. Um, I mean, commenting on your question there, from an industry point of view, we're a small business that's worked with multiple universities um, and gone and jointly gained funding or been in receipt of you know these sort of industry support schemes that are very prevalent down in Cornwall in the southwest. Um, and I think really it boils down to you know it. It's definitely useful for businesses of any size to collaborate with universities. It's a way of, you know, commercialising, generating impact from that research. Um, but it's also, you, there needs to be understanding on both sides of the motivators, both intrinsic and extrinsic, that you know, academics have to you know, solve a really difficult problem and do something really difficult. And from businesses, it's, yes, it would be about making money, but it's also about, you know, aligning that capability with a client's need. And one of the problems we've had sometimes on the bigger programs that we're collaborating with universities is actually the lack of urgency to solve, to, to align that capability that the university has to solving the client need. It's, it comes back to what you said, it's just because you can, should you? And, you know, training those, using those techniques to get to a good enough solution that we can then commercialise that. It's not saying, you know, be slapdash, it's saying actually let's be pragmatic about, you know, it doesn't have to be perfect. It could just be efficient. Yeah, mm. efficient. Yeah. Exactly. And I, I think maybe you know, we would interpret that as that there are different timetables that you know, industry and, and, <coughs> and academia have to work to because of uh, just just the you know the, the fact that academia works on a on a yearly termly um, cycle and, and the sort of funding cycles there. Um, yeah, Gavin. Um, just to follow on, I think, Alison's point, I think one of the most uh, important things, and certainly the successful 
relationships, in fact, with industry have been where we've actually spent the time up front, not talking about technical AI algorithms, but actually what is the problem, and that's really quite hard to express sometimes, because often people come with a, hey, can AI solve my uh, operational needs, please? Uh, but actually defining what the problem is, and then reacting kind of demand-led, uh, rather than kind of a wishy-washy, well, we want to do something like this, academic goes away, does something over a time scale of a few years that does something really, really well, but kind of misses the point a little bit. Um, and I was having a conversation earlier, where we had a really uh, fruitful relationship once where we actually kind of uh, had a, produced an analytic shopping list for a distribution company. Now, some of the things they wanted to do that they thought rocket science, we could do a linear regression by tomorrow, and mm. probably that was enough. Um, and it was, uh, but some things they wanted to do were really complex and would have required research. And I think a lot of the, the effort, a bit like the 80% getting the data ready, in that case, 80% of the effort was not running things, it was actually sorting out the priorities, how much depth to go into certain things, building trust by doing things quickly and efficiently, and then deciding which bits were the ones that required another thousand sample of something and running increasingly uh, important uh, things. But I think that's that's a communication thing and it's also putting in the time and effort at the beginning to really understand the drivers from both sides. Yeah. Indeed. James, do, do you have any questions? Uh, uh, there is one, one that's come through. Do you want to pass it for you to read out? Yeah. Because it's the top one. Thank you. Um, so this is from Bart. Um, how uh, entitled would I have to be to access this data as a private citizen? Um, so yeah, that's that's interesting. So you know, is this is this data available? Maybe um, Liv, do do you want to? Um, uh, you, you know, you've just done a, a, an open yep. university MSc. Uh, yep. what, what was your process for, for getting hold of the data? Just as a as a private individual, um, okay. You, you know, Liv was sponsored by 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 Jean as as a, an employee here to do her MSc, but but you did this as your as your own work. So how did you access that data? Uh, yeah, so the data that I used for the project was Sentinel data, which is freely available for basically anyone to go out and access. And uh, Google Earth Engine is a excellent platform for kind of usability and to be able to actually go in and access and quickly start processing that those data sets. And, and, and just to um, clarify, yeah, Liv, Google Earth Engine is an yeah. entirely different thing to Google Earth. Oh, yeah. So... Um, yeah, um, Google Earth Engine uh, is actually, uh, well, what, one of the ways in which you can use it is through their JavaScript API. So um, you can actually pull in data sets um, into uh, Google Earth Engine and literally uh, process that data in, in there um, and apply these machine learning algorithms and um, really dig in and find pixel information and um everything from those sentinel data set. and when you go in there as well it kind of it overlays this data on a, on a map as well so it's quite a visual interface if you've not looked at it before it's definitely uh worth having a look and there are of course lots of other ways of accessing the sentinel data and interpreting it as well um maybe uh, on, on on the new goon have you uh, YouTube channel, which will start producing some some videos soon. Uh, Liv, we'll, we'll we'll ask you to uh, do an explainer in in more detail for them. Okay. Um, <laughs> but just one more question in in, in an attempt to uh, try and catch up a little bit on the schedule. So, uh, sorry. Yeah, it, it, it goes to that really, and um, obviously we're going to need a lot more data scientists because we're going to need a lot more data and a lot more applications. And I was just interested in what you said about ordinary people accessing. This data. I mean, I don't. I'm, I don't know JavaScript. I know the net, I know the word, but I have no idea how to use it. And I wonder how um, we might think. You know, oh, should we be teaching everyone at school what tools we need to be teaching them in order that they can use this, that it's accessible to them, and that then they can that when they enter the workplace. How do you remove those barriers? Uh, indeed. Uh, says, I can't. I have no way of accessing this data because I don't. Absolutely, and and this this is one of the things that we're we're talking to Google and and to to, uh, to, to Nvidia about as well is um, may, maybe a concept of a of a, a planetary dashboard. You know, I think Google 
uh, Earth, not Google Earth Engine, Google Earth, we all access, and it's so much easier to access Google Earth. Uh, and um, w one of the, the things that we're doing um, <coughs> in terms of that collaboration with Google is to see you know, how can we bring a different perspective onto how, how different layers of access to, uh, to that information. So I, I think certainly we'd be very um, interested in, in that conversation going forward. If I may, um, there, there are a huge number of platforms that are available that are Java based, but they just look like any other computer program that you use, which I think are a really good entry level into handling some of these big data sets. And um, in answer to this in the previous question, you know, a lot of a lot of the data that's available is publicly funded in, in general. And you know, there's a social responsibility that if something's publicly funded, it has to be available to the public. And depending on where that comes from, there could be embargoes for short periods of time because it's tied to a project or there might be a commercial sensitivity. But largely a lot of the data is available. And these platforms kind of make it easier to access that data and use it in a very intuitive, very user-friendly way just to have a play around. And then as you become more confident with incorporating different data sets, you can then build upon that. And there are lots of tutorials out there. But I, I completely agree with you. I think it's absolutely mandatory that we teach the next generation of scientists and engineers that are coming behind us to handle these things as, a, you know, as absolute routine. I think the, the type of technology that I've seen in my generation coming through to, to being in the workforce is already hugely different to what we had at school. And you know, we are teaching kids how to code in schools now, and we teach our undergrads how to program in Python and, and so on. So you know, it's, it's not happening everywhere, but the potential is there to do it. And you know, the pilot programs that we've had and the few schools that are doing it have seen fantastic success. And it, it does need to be rolled out. But again, I think it all comes back to funding and changing those mentalities at a higher level so we can roll it out so it does become the norm. So we're going to have another feedback session this afternoon. So, so if you've got any more questions, um, there'll be another session. But also, uh, we'll be talking as well about a follow-on um, workshop that we're going to have after this meeting uh, that's coming up in, in a few weeks' time. Uh, and I think that's a really good um, sort of point that in the workshop, we, should, you know, we, we want to discuss with you what, what that workshop should look like. But, but I think having... Um, some examples of how we can access into that data is, 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 is really good. So, um, Natasha and Olivia, thank you very much for, um, for, for the chat. Thank you. Brilliant. Okay. So, just going to so this next session um, is really quite interesting. Basically, got three lightning talks from three quite different businesses so, or organisations. So we've got uh, Richard uh, Pierce, Cornwall Council. We've got a lot of data and just starting to understand what they could do with what the data sets is and what the data could be used for. We've got uh, Nathan from Coastline Housing, who's here. He's going to talk about um, well, they've been working quite close with the Smartline program about smarter properties. And then we've got um, Richard from Secure Forest looking at. Um, deforestation and the data gathered from that. The idea behind this is it, it could just be interesting for you guys, but also potentially you've got businesses may have ways of taking the problem they've got and commercializing or helping them with it. So that's the idea behind it. Should be a bit of a conversation as well as just a rather than a monologue. But um, first up, we'll have Richard. Go, Richard. So just, just so you give a context, so we had an event at the Eden Project a couple of weeks ago. And Rich came along to talk about environmental intelligence and the council, and it's got real aspirations around the environment. And it turned out, actually, Rich was quite popular because he had data sets, and people in the audience wanted to know more about the data the council's got and how they can get involved, and is it freely available data. Mm. So this is over to you now to kind of give us a little bit more information about the data sets and where, what the council's going with this. Well, thank you very much for that. I, I, I won't repeat everything I said the, uh, the last time. A uh, quick bit of context for those who don't know. Cornwall Council um, is a unitary authority. Uh, it's the, the council for the whole of Cornwall. A £2 billion organisation. Very, very forward thinking. We like to think, of course. Uh, you know, in, investing in building the, the UK's first spaceport trying to put together um, a Celtic sea power, for instance, one of the, the largest offshore wind installations anywhere in the world. We are really trying to push the boundaries. We, we think we need to use the fact that we are this, this big monolith of a, of a council. We're actually, I think, the biggest unitary authority in the entire country. So we're trying to use this to be at the forefront of things. Cornwall is a high-tech area, 
and we want to invest, we want to, we want to um, support, but we also recognize that we need to share. Um, I mean, data, the problem is I keep trying to dig into to, uh, uh, to our tech guys. So what do we need? What do we, what do we want? And the answer is yes to everything. And underlying that is the, is the problem that we don't really know what we want. We know we want everything, but because a lot of this technology is just so sci-fi to us in, in a lot of ways, what, what would we do if we had a live video feed of anywhere in Cornwall from, from a satellite? I mean, the first things that jump to mind, you're like, oh, well, you know, we could, we could monitor the beaches and we could, we could check if, if uh, you know, if a river's overflowing. It'd be really good for disaster management, things like that. But realistically, those things are so easy and obvious and basic that they're probably going to constitute a very tiny proportion of what this technology is actually used for. And because we haven't even dreamt of having it until very, very recently, I don't think the killer apps are actually there yet. And we recognize that a lot of the tech is going to be used in ways we haven't even dreamt of right now. So what I'm trying to do at the moment is get together our people and a lot of the people in this room to sit down, have coffees, get talking and talk about their dreams. What's going to happen in 10 years or, or 20 years? Because actually those things are probably going to happen in five years or, or not at all. I mean, you know, it goes both ways. But as we're having these conversations, what we're really recognizing is that we're pulling in all of this data uh, and we're building huge systems to warehouse it and to use it and to, to interact with it. But what we also then need to do is we're a public body. We need to share this data publicly. We need to make it available to you. And every single person who's come up to me at any one of these events has said, we're a tech company. How do we access it? It's just what was being talked about there. I feel it's incumbent upon us to connect with you, especially since we're going to end up with so, well, we already have so much data. We, we need to make it available. It's, it's, it's companies and people like yourselves who are going to really figure out what to do with it, who are going to make those killer apps that we're actually going to change the way that the council operates, that all of us operate. So we have got to be plugged into you doing that, and that is what we're going to be doing going forward. We're going to make everything we possibly can publicly available. We've got a huge new system that we're designing and putting together at the moment, and one of the key elements of that is sharing and interactivity, APIs, plugins, etc. That's a huge piece of work to do, but I can promise you we're going to be ready for it. Um, and at risk of taking any more time, is it worth asking for questions or do yeah, I swap over for someone else? I definitely interested in questions. I'll first question though, I suppose. You mentioned <laughs> you want to open up for businesses to get involved, to use the data, so it's like open data. Mm. Do you see the council though having the skill set internally to be able to process the data or is it literally going to be opening up to business because there isn't the skill set within the council? Early days at the moment, we're, as I say, we're creating new systems to do all of this at the moment, and we're in discussions as to what skill sets we need in the council. We'd, we'd like to do as much as we can uh, in Cornwall, I would say internally to the council, but we're very, very open to partnerships. But some of this is very, very complicated stuff, and so obviously we will be bringing in people where we need them. Um, but again, that, that's a conversation that we're having at the moment. Brilliant. Okay. Does anyone have particular questions for uh, Richard? No? Well, wow, one thing brilliant. I did notice from this presentation earlier, particularly uh, Gavin's when he talked about uh, mm. Bristol City, about how they're looking at the heat. I don't know if that's a particular problem in Cornwall, but it's the, I don't know if Cornwall Council has done anything like that. Well, this is, again, this is, the, this is the thing. We want everything. I mean, literally, we want everything because the, the council has, has fingers in, in every pie that you can e even imagine. Uh, do we need to sort of monitor sewage outflows into the sea? Yes, we do. Do we need to monitor air quality all across Cornwall? Yes, we do. You name it. If we're not monitoring it, we probably should be. So how do we, how do we get from how we're doing things at the moment to where we'd like to be? Um, I mean, we, we were just talking with Gavin earlier on about things that things that it would be nice to do if you if you've got live data sets of the whole of cornwall surely you can get algorithms to to look at it. you can look when the cliffs are shifting you can see when a, a, a cliff fall is about to happen when a river is about to burst its banks you can start predicting these things so it's not just a case of replacing what we're doing now with space data it's about 
going forward and saying, well, actually, if we could predict when this is going to happen or when that's going to happen, or we can see that a problem is developing, we can be proactive and get out there and start fixing it now rather than just, oh, there's been a, you know, there's been a pile up on the A30, send someone up there. Instead, you can, you can see this happen or you can even stop it from happening depending on the sort of data you're getting. So it, it's a fascinating way forward, but we, we need to be engaging with you. And I would imagine a lot of you wish to be engaging with us to access the data that we've got. Oh, now some hands have gone up. Oh, I must have done something. Yeah. <laughs> Go, Luke. Did you say that you, know, you want everything fantastic? Mm. I'm not so sure about specific to Cornwall because I think a lot of the things that are applicable here are applicable everywhere. Um, we're a very, you know, we're a long rural area. And so communications and getting people from place to place is, is one of the key things. Uh, I mean, immediately springing to mind, I think that, that you know, the most pressing issues are always going to be uh, um, emergencies and emergency management with the, the storm the other week. Um, my colleagues uh, in the in the the Kerno bunker were feeding things back to me, which is that you, you know, you you get a phone call. So no, we've we've got a tree down here. It, it might be you know might be knocking out some power lines, um, but everyone's phone's gone down, so no one can tell you any more data about it. Well, when did they report this? Oh, probably about an hour ago. Well, has it been fixed? Has anyone gone there? You know, it's that kind of coordination. You end up spending a huge amount of time trying to figure out things, which is has a tree fallen over? Now, if you had live video feed um, of, of Cornwall from a satellite that you could just zoom right in on, you could go, yep, send someone there, that's happening. Oh, they've just arrived, that's okay. Like a little, a tiny little thing like that, like being able to see something can save thousands upon thousands of hours of people's work. Um, so that's just one thing that springs to mind. But this. There's so many different ways we could use this. I would, I would suggest that live, live data from Cornwall would be absolutely critical to us. But then as soon as you start breaking that down by what other things could you get, environmental monitoring data would be absolutely critical. Uh, um, look, if, you, if you feed it into it, we can find ways to use it. But that's why I'm so um, passionate that we've got to share it because we're, we're going to use it to probably duplicate what we're already doing. What, are, what we really want is people like yourselves out there going, yeah, but what if you did it like this? What if you scrapped all of that and tried this? And that is where we're really going to bring in the changes. More hands are coming up. Uh, yeah. I'll, I'll come to the back in a minute. Um, I just wanted to say you should utilise um, the startups to literally fill every gap that mm. you have. As in, literally work with them or start and fund incubators, mm -hmm. even even out of high school, um, because the, um, the the tiny little ideas that will fill the gaps um, can be instantly solved with um, the available algorithms that are out there and with the available data. Not necessarily even satellite. Um, you know, I, I lost power in um, in the first storm that we had, um, but you still have text capability, and you can make an entire network with every single person in the you know in cornwall that has a mobile phone purely by mm. um, sending a text you can have a live feed that is far better than twitter even twitter wasn't quick enough um you know for for the three storm for the back to back mm. storms that we all just had mm. um, and that's you know already said to be you know better than newspapers and etc but this is the quickest and you can mm. often you know, forget satellite feeds, you know, because you, you, you will have massive issues with privacy yeah. um, around, you know, communities. But, but you can start to, number one, have startups fill the gaps and, and come up with, because they'll get the VC for it, mm. you know, yeah. even if it comes from, from you know, Silicon Valley. Um, but using the mobile networks are more at SMS level, mm -hmm. which aren't going to be effective, you know, if you can't get internet access somewhere. Brilliant. Yeah. Couldn't agree more. I've um, got a question online, um, which is, as a tourist hotspot, what, does, um, what ideas do you have to use data to improve the tourist experience? Again, there's, there's so many that spring to mind. Mm. And, uh, and again, 
the the obvious stuff uh, as basic as um, you know how busy a beach is you can direct people and say well actually that that beach is stuffed full you could come over here but I think even as I say things like that I think that's very kind of parochial if it were um, you know, how, how many how many people are really going to dive in and use systems like that I think a lot of the real changes are going to be systems integration types where it's 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 using data behind the scenes um, you know feeding it back to for instance Google um, and actually being able to in real time perhaps direct direct traffic flows throughout the county that's actually going to be much more useful to the tourists than where's the pasty delivery truck coming um, you know how busy is your beach that kind of thing very useful and, and no doubt a lot of people will be very very interested in that kind of tech but I really feel that it's the it's the behind the scenes stuff that'll actually make the big differences but that actually won't even be noticed by anyone unfortunately Brilliant. it's usually the best ideas are so we've got <laughs> one more question just for the next session there was a lady at the back there of businesses um, using space data, but how does this help communities, I guess, especially in like, terms of flooding, we're having another conference, we're co-hosting mm. co the next conference in November, about how we can actually help communities in flood, flood mitigation, so I guess it's bringing those um, businesses that are using this data in helping communities directly, so does that need to be a, a, a gap that's filled there? Well, there's partly you need you, you need to get the the businesses and and councils and communities working together and that's that's one of the reasons we're, we're sort of trying to do more with with events like this and and better integration but i think one thing is for me again making making more data publicly available and accessible allows individuals to really engage with it in a way that you wouldn't ever consider i mean just little things what was it the other week um be, being able to go online and go on lightningmap.org and that gives you live feeds of where every lightning bolt has has struck during a storm and so you're watching uh, things come in in real time and then you can actually see storms moving away from us and you can start to say oh well the problem isn't going to be over the St Austell area it's moving towards Truro and as an individual to be able to do that and make judgment calls uh, for people in my business but also for people in the council without waiting for a big government organization to to do it for you you can actually access data like this real time and so for the flood forum it's it's providing more data like that for instance you could be you know you could be looking at, at water level buildups in real time and how could you as an individual or how could a, a small scale flood forum or individual uh, village look at that and use that data rather than saying well the council told us things will be fine but actually that data the data they were going off was six hours out of date and they weren't really looking at us properly you know it, it's, it's breaking that down to an individual level is so much more useful i hope that sort of answered your question brilliant well thank you very much ah. it's really interesting so thank you for richard ah. thank you very much well, you could swap your mic really nicely Okay. So the next um, speaker is Nathan Marlow from Coastline Housing. So I was really keen to get Coastline Housing involved because they're a housing association, but they are also going to be gathering a lot of data. And so I thought it might be quite an interesting talk from uh, Nathan about what Coastline are doing, the project they did with um, Smartline program, and the use of potential use of satellite data for their property management. That's all right. Thank you, James. I'm the director of finance and people at Coastline Housing. Um, so funny, complete imposter in that industry, very much so in that finance and people with so not really data. So I'll do the bit that I've had in my mind. I think I made that point in thinking around might use data for. We own and manage just over 5,000. Really interesting conversation. Kind of the start of the morning around uh, 
what, what, what does that mean when you've got an asset base and how might you use it and what might you look at it and is it a product or not? I think that's, that's where our work is. Your, is mic, not, your mic's not working, so if you just not. put the battery in your pocket. Oh, sorry. Sorry. It'll be happier. There we go. Apparently. Is that better? <laughs> is, that, is that doing the one? Okay. Um, that's good. It's also good that I'm in charge of IT at Coastline as well, so that will reassure <laughs> anyone who picks this up afterwards. Um, so that's the point around the assets and the piece of work that our uh, head of innovation and procurement, Mark England, did with the University of Exeter on the Smartline project. We know that our homes, it would be great from a repairs point of view, that's fundamentally, if you own 5,000 homes, um, we spend a lot of our time focusing on getting them repaired. That's, that's probably our singular obsession. Um, as well as collecting the rent, I suppose I should say, being a finance trader. But fundamentally, it's about keeping the repair, keeping the property in good order. And one of the many things that would be great, a bit like we talk about the, uh, the magic of the would order things before they run out. We would ideally like a house that all its repairs, the customer even knew about it, that would be. So the idea behind putting sensors in all of the properties was, are there, anything, are there things within properties that might give you an indication of a repair need? And uh, Mark's original thought was one of the things we see a lot of, and you'll have seen it on the news a lot around kind of moisture and damp um, and how those things escalate over time. Um, and a lot of that's to do with faulty fans. Now, fans in bathrooms are very, very cheap to repair. Um, the most expensive bit of repairing a fan is um, getting somebody out there to repair it. Um, so again, having that preventative process around getting repairs ordered on fans would have been... Uh, would be we put, put the um, sensors in... Uh, just about 200 properties. One of the hard things in getting sensors into everyone's properties was getting customers to agree. Um, the first round of smart line sensors didn't look pretty. They were pretty ugly. So when it comes to data collection, it's definitely worth thinking, uh, what does it look like to customers, your consumers? What's the end product look like? But having started to collect data from 200 odd properties across the past, we've had really, really interesting things from the University of Exeter. Um, if you own a dog and you bring a wet dog into your house, how long it takes your house to dry out? <clears throat> Um, is that interesting or, or not? Um, maybe it is back into the interesting or so what? It does help when you look at the overall moisture levels within properties that then, that then do have a tendency to cause damp. Um, I think the other highlight that came up for me was how long it takes your house to dry out after Christmas because you're all inside, you spend a lot of time eating and drinking and cooking. Um, it takes something like six, six, six days, I think it is, for your house to dry out after Christmas. <clears throat> and, that's, and that's worth noting. So I guess the reason I wanted to... Um, Talk about that. It's, for me, that's been a successful project in that the idea behind is there a data point that would give you an indication of a repairing type that would enable us to get out and do something early? The answer is yes. The bit that's then followed, and the bit that I think is interesting in, in listening to various bits that have been talked about, which I have to say is a certain amount that definitely goes over my head, um, is that challenge around all the extra data that you get and how you can use it. And that's been the bit that, okay, so I know there are a number of different things that can create moisture in a property, um, but they're still not necessarily smart enough to come up with an output. So is it more sensors? Do I need sensors on doors, windows, and a variety of other things to help work out where the repairs might be? Um, somebody else mentioned communities. And I think that's the other thing. So Coastline do a lot of work in communities. And one of the things that does seem to spring to mind on space type data is if we had a map, a better map, or a more interactive map of a lot of our community space, could we do more with that space? Could we find a way of joining our communities up with space to make that work? That point around commercialization, I spend a lot of my time thinking about how we monetize things at Coastline. Um, and I think that is the hard point. Um, the Sunday Times, did not, uh, for those of you who read the Sunday Times, I think it was two weeks ago, a whole big data piece on, on, on data, on big data. And the challenge in that, again, maybe thinking around the, it's interesting, so what is, what's the problem you're trying to solve? And I think that's fundamentally the challenge all the time, and I think Alice might make that point as well, that you have to think, what's the problem you're trying to solve, and how might we use this data to try and fix it? Um, I own lots of homes, I have lots of, lots of people who live in those homes, and I'd like to do something to make their lives better. I'm waiting for inspiration today. Um, it may well come from a question. Um, but equally, from the conversation this morning, one of the biggest benefits, I think, we've had two years of a lot of focusing on our small screens, looking at the world in a very small way, and trying to keep ourselves together. And for me, today's one of those opportunities to just go, actually think really, really big, think as big as you can think. Um, and conversations already this morning might mean we're doing a door entry, all the door entry systems need to be replaced. Um, should we be doing something more clever with our door entry systems that links up to some of the smart line sensors or something else? So um, already, thank you. I feel like I've achieved my uh, goal for the day. 
which was having an alternative and another way to, to look at some of our future projects. But I'm um, happy to take any questions or join any of the bits up with that, James. Does anyone have any um, questions? Um, I've got loads. Just, just to say that there are tools out there, um, and I wish we could all you know, get together and put them on a, one website and then tell everybody where that website is. And you know, the problem is um, that you know, there's tools like if you everybody Googles Earth North School, that was you know, one guy who put together a ton of things that'll tell you the fires that are ongoing around the globe using Google Earth, mm -hmm. etc. etc. So that's one tool. MLHub.earth um, will provide data sets for any kind of question, but it'll either, it'll also tell you some of the questions you should be asking, okay. you know, that maybe your communities and, and the people in, in your homes need. Um, the problem is bringing it all together yeah. so that everybody mm -hmm. knows, you know, I mean, at the moment, Google, you know, has the authority on that, but. Um, cool. Thank you. Chloe? I was going to ask um, how much your residents can see the data. So I've, I've, we've all got smart meters now, and, I've, and it's just really interesting yeah. just being able to see that. I mean, in this one, so I could see. Interesting, so what? I probably use less. And I. Yeah, that's really interesting. Yeah, on the part and past of the Smart Line project was very much around. So every customer, every household had a tablet. So a significant amount of training and upskilling for people living in their homes. It's almost like handing a Honda driver a Mercedes. You know, there's a whole load of extra systems that you have to suddenly learn how to use. It's like, I just need a steering wheel. Um, and yeah, no, we spent a long time um, with people working with individuals, getting them trained on the tablet so they could very much see the data. And I think, I think that point around smart meters and the idea that if your house is is like a, a big product, a big thing that you have. Um, how do you know it's running efficiently? And I think it is something like smart meters and moisture. There's a whole raft of things that could that could come out of it. And I think one of the I think the challenges for us, because I think someone, the point came up about heat. And I think that's really interesting. When you think about how you heat your home, we all know you're supposed to heat your home by having good insulation and leaving your heating on all the time and on low. None of our residents do that. And all the smart line data says that's not what people do. The heating's like this up and down. Um, but through that process of education, with, um, with a couple of people who continue to work in the community with those smart line residents, um, we have actually managed to educate them because you can talk, you can turn it into actual pounds and pence savings. As like, well, actually, you know, if you try doing it this way, and think about how satisfied you are with how warm your house is. Again, it's a satisfaction data point, along with heat data point, and then that has helped actually helped people use that live in their houses in a more effective way, which has saved them money. But that's only in two hundred and. Uh, we know how much that costs is sort of scaling that up is maybe the next challenge but no i, I think getting customers to see yeah I th exactly that yes yep yeah absolutely yeah and that's a really good point brilliant one more question uh mike um Yeah. What's the UPRN of the, of the house, or what's the postcode that the neighbourhoods that we have a lot of responsibility for, and which are most going to be affected by heat? If you deliver that, and they can basically say, well, okay, this is where we're going to focus on increasing the EPC rating of a home, or this is where we're going to think about retrofitting insulation. It's not saying you know, it's the so what question, or let's just drive down to the simple answer yeah. that anyone, absolutely anyone, can pick up and go, okay, I know how to do it value out of that. And yes, you can deliver these really fancy GS tools, which we're usually designed to do because they look nice, but actually it's just more what's a useful tool for your person. Yeah, I, I think it's a really good point. That, again, I, someone said about, do we look at data scientists or training more? Di they, how do we train people to have the skills that they need? And at the moment, there's a lot of people in my organisation be very happy that if you send a spreadsheet with things on, they'd be, ah, oh, over the moon. And it is, there's a, there's a big gap between kind of the art of the possible and the, what someone's doing in their day job. And the more you can either provide that, and so, yeah, that's the sort of service people would pay for. So back to the, how do you commercialise some of the massive amount of data and what you've got? It's actually the more you can simplify it. It might seem simple, but again, simple products sell well. Yeah. Uh, one question, uh, Chris, you had one more Oh yeah, I was um, interested to know whether or not you're like looking to develop it yourself and have the uh, sort of, I guess, IP around whether or not there's um, 
like generating a product that would tell you when it needs mm -hmm. preventive maintenance, or if you're looking for a company to come in with a solution and go, look, here's this product, stick it on all your homes, problem solved. Um, in partnership, I think, is the answer. That's um, Our plan is very much we think we we think the housing problem in Cornwall is solvable and we'll do our best to solve it and that requires you to work in partnership because you can only do the things you're really, really good at and you should focus on doing the things you're really, really good at and find people who are really good at building sensors and get them to it. So no, we no, no interest in doing the IP, more than happy to talk to people about how we put Brilliant. that together. Cool, well that's really good. Mm -hmm. So cool. thank you very much for the talk. Um, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And one final uh, talk from Richard from Secure Forest. And Richard, you've got a presentation for us, I believe. <coughs> yeah, do you want to plug it, yours yeah, in there? I'll, or? I'll plug that in. Excuse me a minute. Oops. Sorry. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah, take that. Thank you. Cool. So. Oh, is that yours? Is it? Cool. Oh, yeah. Brilliant. Cool. Well, so, oops. Excuse me. Do you want to help with that? That's lovely. Cool. Thank you. Just unplug it. So um, everyone, I want to introduce you to Richard. Richard's from Secure Forests, um, a community interest company. Um, and he's got some interesting information to show us, as well as this as device well here. As well as breaking the IT. Yeah. There we go. Thank you. Okay, is that going to load? If not, we have a backup plan, I think. Okay. Oh, there we go. Oh, okay. Is that going to work? If not, we'll go back to yours. Simple as that. Yeah, should we just do that, I think? Yeah, we'll go back to that. That's fine. Try for the technical challenges. Yeah, apologies. Thank you. Cool. There you go. That's a new widget, is it? Yeah. Over to you, Richard. Yeah, good morning or good afternoon. Hopefully, we'll get a presentation. Um, my name is Richard Pyshaw. I represent we're Secure just, Forests. We just restart the PowerPoint. Sure. I've broken. Devastation. Um, I'm from a, a military background. I spent 30 years in the UK military, learning lots of mistakes over the years. Um, formed Secure Forest in 2020, and it's um, basically our primary focus is protecting landscapes. That's, that's our main aim. Um, from the veterans community, um, so again, we can use that knowledge and hopefully knowledge to good use. To use our PR companies, we've gone from national security to natural security. That's our aim, really. Um, what we try to do is represent the end users, so rangers, protected area managers around the world, to get this data and get this, this um, situational awareness in the right hands. So again, not to train people into militias, but provide rangers the technology that can be usable on the ground, and that's apl applicable in places like Central America or in the UK. So what we try and do is create um, what we call a sustainable landscape. So we use multi-levels -level of technology, including satellite monitoring using Sentinel-1 and 2. Um, then other technologies such as the acoustic sensors, such as the Guardian sensor you can see in front of you and then integrate all these sensors into a usable platform that rangers can be more situationally awareness, aware of what's going on on the ground. Um, we tend to listen to what the range, rangers and the protected area managers need to create this sustainable landscape, um, understanding the threats that they face 
for example, you know, whether it be uh, smoke uh, fires or illegal logging, poaching or um, wildlife crime within that sustainable landscape. What we also do is work with key partners on the ground, such as you know, NGOs and various other things, to create micro industries within the rainforest and within that area. Because what we've got to try and do when we go in is make that project enduring. So people can actually continue that project once we've, we've uh, stepped away from that landscape. So it's really key that we work with, with good partners. We then use uh, platforms such as the Ecometrica platform, uh, which uses Sentinel-1 and 2 data, which you're familiar with most of you. And we uh, use that to basically do an analysis of the landscape and look at where we can best use our technologies um, and appropriate technologies, because it might not be appropriate if we're 60 to 100 kilometers in the middle of a rainforest uh, where they may not get uh, a GSM signal. So it's appropriate technology that's simple to use. We then build a pic picture of what's going on in that particular area. And then we then put in various uh, kit and equipment to help them um, protect, and, uh, protect that particular area. Started this work in 2014, and that's in Belize in Central America, where at the time they were uh, dealing with problems such as the illegal forest trade where the cedar and mahogany trees were being taken from the landscape um, for um, basically across into the Mexican border. Um, obviously nowadays with uh, the threats from not only the illegal logging but wildfires, um, that's a problem that we're, we're trying to solutionize. Obviously there is satellite detection for wildfires, but from a ranger's perspective on the ground, they need a very simple and cheap method to detect, you know, smoke and illegal fires. Um, we're also working with a project up in Scotland who the end users say that with rewilding, one of the problems with that is the increase in fuel load. So again, we're looking at uh, working with industry to try and develop cheap and cost-effective live feeds to pick up on wildfires around the world. This is the result of industrialized uh, deforestation. This is in Belize, in Central America. And that's not the odd one or two trees, that's the illegal cattle ranching, which we, we face on a daily basis on the border. I'm not sure we can get access to that, that's fine. So uh, our major project, as I say, we've been working in Central America. We're developing projects in Ecuador, uh, in Zimbabwe, and various other things. So. One of the themes of this, this conference is how we can commercialize the data and how we can make these projects enduring. Because what we do is try and give this product to the end user for free. So how can we make it enduring? Well, we're, we're cl collecting hours and hours of digital data um, that is owned by the end user, these guys. So they can use that data, that acoustic data and so on, to sell on for research and also it can also drive ecotourism in the area. So this particular reserve, Pooks Hill Reserve in Belize, they have a lot of birders, a lot of tourists go that, to this particular area. So they can actually identify, you know, bird species amongst the acoustic data that they're collecting, and then they can promote their own ecotourism, which then replaces the acoustic sensors that we put into, into Belize. Um, one of the main uh, products we use, we're not beholden to one company, but one particular AI technology that we're really keen on is the Guardian sensor. It's provided by a company called Rainforest Connect, based in Seattle. Um, a very colorful guy called Topher White set the company up about 10 years ago. He went to the Amazon rainforest and was 100 meters from illegal deforestation occurring under his nose. He was a tech guy and he said, actually, how can I develop a tech that would detect illegal deforestation. Hence the first Guardian sensor, which was made out of mobile phones, recycled mobile phones, and solar panels. Um, Guardian 2, the, the one you can see here, has got a much better uh, a range, acoustic range of up to three kilometers. And the AI technology itself is incredible in the fact um, we just have to ask questions of it. So being an ex-military guy, having operated in the jungle as well, 
as you move through a rainforest, the pitch and the frequency will change. So we asked the sensor and the guys behind the AI technology if that could be detected and given an indication and a signal into a mobile phone of a ranger. And that's the case. They're developing the latest technology that will detect the frequency of that rainforest. And if there's any elevation of pitch, it will then signal a ranger. Um, other developments with this system in Belize, in our trials and developments in Belize, they're able to learn a species, an animal species. So, for example, in Belize, um, we've asked it to learn Scarlet Macaw language. So the Scarlet Macaw will have a normal pitch and then it will have an alerting pitch and frequency. That frequency, when it's detected, will then send a text message to the ranger. Therefore, they can either send a drone or a patrol to make sure they can protect that species. So AI technology is developing week on week and the Guardian is one of the really usable systems. Um, the criteria for a system we use in the rainforest, obviously, it's got to be robust. So again, this, the Guardian you can see here today has a, um, solar panels on top, which protect it from the wind and rain that you get in tropical rainforests. So what does it sound like? Hopefully we've got some sound and that might work. So this was the hilltop sensor we put in place 80 foot up in a tree and it gives a pictorial graphic of what we can see is a chainsaw operating here and then the normal sound of the rainforest. So even when it's outside of the pitch of the human ear, we can use this text message, go straight into the ranger's phone and he can pick up that, rain, that chainsaw. I'll shut up now. So using this data, I'll move on to the next one if I can. So using this data, again, this is just a Central American howler monkey. They can use that data to react, react to it, uh, send a patrol out to that area. I'll just do a short excerpt of a Central American. Those have experienced howler monkeys, they're like uh, the ghosts of the rainforest. So hopefully we should be able to do that. No, go back. So that was transmitted sort of six in Cornwall. So straight in my laptop, again, the power of AI technology and the power of these centers. So key achievements for our project in 2020, obviously 2020 significant, that's when we were in lockdown. We were able to position six or five acoustic sensors into a small reserve called the Pooks Hill Reserve. The power of this technology is the fact that we can produce graphs and charts of increased activity. So Britain went into lockdown in March. Belize in Central America went into lockdown in April. We were able to detect with our forest domain awareness system an increase of vehicle activity on the 1st of April. On the 1st of April, that's when Belize went into lockdown. We detected increased um, vehicle activity in an area to the south of our reserve. We then saw an increase in chainsaw act activity, which then peaked on the 26th of over 60 chainsaw events um, detected in one area to the south of our acoustic sensors. So the power of this technology is the fact that we can get live feeds back from our acoustics using our satellite overwatch with Ecometrica, all brought to, together to then hopefully remove the, the issues of deforestation within a particular area. So the south of our area unprotected, but our area remained 99% protected. Can I ask a really quick question? 
Sure. So, so does that kind of autonomously act on that information? Does it identify, you know, an event or multiple events that is a change there? Does that have to come back to a knock in Cornwall and then you have to alert the rangers? No, it's straight into their phones. So straight into their Android, Android phone or straight into their laptops. So I get, I get exactly the same feed, so you can have multiple feeds, so multiple ranges can get that information to act upon it. So a really useful, useful tool. Um, once we then identify, so using the satellite data, I can show you later on the Ecometrica platform that we use, which provides us that planning activity. We can then um, plan pre-planned operations where we put in things like seismic sensors to detect footprints, this system uh, detects footprints. It can detect as somebody's walking along a train with a, a trail with a chainsaw. It has um, magnetic sensitivities as well, and this all data can be sent either by GSM network or by satellite. So once we've identified entrances and egresses into a rainforest, we can put these devices, which can operate cameras, and we use this particular system. Then we can record. Um, and, and attached to, to cameras, then we can record who is actually doing these events and it's sent into the ranges as well. So this is a fully integration forest, forest domain awareness system that helps the rangers to become more situationally aware. The last thing we provide is this system, which is the Vulcan Earth Ranger, which was provided by Google. And this is essentially a data fusion platform which allows the user to see everything that's going on within their landscape. So the, it was mentioned earlier about how we get live feeds of everything that's going on in our landscape, Earth Ranger is it. So this has been used extensively in Africa, but we were the first ones to use it in a rainforest. So on here we can put ground-based sensors, so we get alerts into that alert into the system. From these sensors we can put patrol reports in, um, damage reports, wildlife sightings, all of these sort of things. So imagine this around a rainforest. We're also picking up illegal acts, but we're also picking up detections of wildlife species such as jaguars, scar scarlet macaws. All of this then develops into a sustainable landscape which can be used for ecotourism in the future. Uh, we're operating the system in the UK and we're hoping to operate the system in Cornwall. Um, as a development tool. We're working with a, a partner up in Allerdale, the biggest rewilding project in Scotland. And again, the end users here are really telling us that their threats that they face are firstly monitoring of deer populations, which in the UK is out of control. And secondly, the fuel load. With rewilding, what you tend to get is they're not burning off heather, particularly in Scotland. They're planting more tree species and those tree species need to be protected for at least 10 years. So how do we protect them with manpower? Virtually impossible. So again, there's an open market here where using these technologies, we can observe remotely, provide protected area managers data and information, but we're still to, to, to crack one of the nuts, which is the fire threat to these areas. So that's one of the things we're looking at with this particular landscape. And the UK, obviously, with the rewilding, there are threats that we can counter with our systems. Uh, we're very grateful to several partners who've helped us fund our research projects so, uh, so far, including the UK Space Agency and the European Space Agency as part of Forest 2020. Uh, that's my presentation. Hopefully there might be some questions. Cool. Thanks very much, Richard. Thanks. Oh. Andy's got a question very high up in the Andy. We focus very much, when we're thinking about space-based assets, especially we're focusing very much on Earth observation data, which is, you know, it's, it's obvious because you get a lot of data coming out of Earth observation data. But I'm sort of thinking here of another satellite asset, which is satellite communications. So I, that's what I've got in my head when I'm asking the question. So the, the, ap the application that you talked about that's, the, the, that's using the acoustics to get the knowledge, it's relying, from what I understood from what you said, it's relying on, on terrestrial mobile applications, isn't it? So you, you need the, the guy, the ranger, to have a 4G signal for him to be able to receive that information. And, uh, you know, I mean, at, at the end of the day, you're, you're relying on, on mobile communications or terrestrial communications uh -huh. for that to work. Is that, is that right? Because 
you know, this would work with satellite communications as well, you know, so you can look at other ways of using space-based assets to actually deliver this as a service. So you could put it in the middle of nowhere with no terrestrial signal, no mobile signal at all, and it would still work because you could use actually a, mo a, a, a satellite, and you know, a satellite communications and a satellite antenna with it. Yeah, exactly. So Rainforest Connect have looked at where there is no <coughs> signal at all, and they've got a satellite connection with this Guardian sensor. So agreed, at the end of the day, we need to have a multi-layered system, including the satellite. What happens when there is no this cloud base? Well, this can take over and, and can listen. Um, with, the, with the Ranger on the ground, we also provide Garmin inReach as well. So they can, they can use that to connect to these systems as well. So yes, what we need is primarily um, satellite with a fallback of GSM or the other way around. That, that would be the Rolls-Royce solution. But it comes down to cost. It comes down to cost. Um, how are we going to look at this in the future? Who can fund these projects? I mean, that's part of the, the story here. We're working with Exeter University and Deep Digital Cornwall to look at um, sustainable mining solutions. Jehovah Mining, most of the mining um, and for cobalt, uh, various other mineral products are from rainforests. So we're looking at how the mining industry potentially could clean up their act a bit and provide money to provide this system to support local communities and forest security and protection. Cool. Yes. Yep. Hi. Um, great talk, thanks. I, I wanted to ask about uh, how you deal with predicting where the things are that you detect. So you said that you, know, you found the chainsaws to the south of your, your reserve. Um, is there any way you can actually triangulate that, or is that a limitation of your technology, or is that a limitation of how many sensors you can get to actually triangulate it? Um, the first thing we do is obviously talk to the community and the, the protected area managers to understand how the landscape works. So that's the first, and that, again, that's part of the journey of empowering them and, and listening to them. Secondly, we look at if there's any seasonal variations to that as well. Thirdly, the system itself will now, for example, uh, with three of these systems in place, we can now triangulate where things are happening. So if it's a gunshot, it will triangulate and give you a GPS fix on where it is as well. Cool. So it's a pretty cool piece of kit. Brilliant. Any more questions? No? Well, with that, I'll say thank you very much, Richard. Thank you. Thanks for that. Well, that's uh, lunch now. So um, everyone here, we've got lunch at the back. So help yourself. You obviously take your food into the more tables and space around the corner. For those online, we'll see you probably about ten past three. Uh, ten past not three. Ten past one. Thank you. Thank you. No,
<laughs> Take a seat, come on. Yeah. Can I have sit down? <laughs> good afternoon, everyone. Thank you. I hope you all had a good lunch. Um, and everyone online who's now rejoined us, so thank you very much. Um, this afternoon now we've got a talk from Alison from NVIDIA, um, who has a huge amount of knowledge in the area of AI, has been working really closely with Goon Hilly of late. So Alison, over to you. Thank you. Um, so I'm assuming you can hear me okay, and hopefully there won't be any feedback. I'm going to glue myself to this, uh, to this position. Um, first of all, an apology. Um, I had some sort of um, IT issues with Microsoft PowerPoint. Sorry, Microsoft, but um, so this is a hash together at 2 a.m. version of the talk that I was going to give, which I'll completely forget to tell you most things. However, it's also going to be a lot of slides, and I don't want you to be overwhelmed by the fact that there are so many tools, so many areas that NVIDIA is actually working on. So I'll be providing a PDF, so don't think you've got to scribble down absolutely everything that I'm talking about. And fingers crossed, it's all going to work. So. For those of you who don't know NVIDIA, um, this is headquarters in Santa Clara, Silicon Valley. Um, that's Endeavour on, uh, on the left. Um, Voyager on the right is just being completed. People are just starting to sort of filter in. Obviously, COVID's still bad in, uh, in the US, so we're definitely uh, nowhere near back to normal. Um, but over at the back there is um, Celine. So this is a, a slightly closer version of, of Celine. Um, I think it's goddess of the moon, basically, um, that um, she was named after. This is our latest supercomputer. Um, NVIDIA is obviously known for gaming, but it's, um, if, in case you don't know, it's graphics processing units. Um, but there's a lot more to NVIDIA than just graphics processing units. However, they are a coprocessor and accelerator that works alongside um, a CPU to do all of um, today's high-performance computing. Um, Celine is currently the world's number six in the top 100, so that's the most efficient supercomputer. Um, but aside from the building itself, she was actually put together in under a month because of the modular aspect. Um, what you're looking at here is a run through on one of the racks of, um, of Celine. Each of those gold boxes are about the size of a, um, a hotel minibar, and they contain eight ampere chip generation um, GPUs, but also all of the extremely fast networking. Um, we acquired an Israeli company called Mellanox, so they're the people who are um, in charge of moving the trillions of operations per second that typical AI workloads um, actually need. But also it's adjoining very fast, rapid access storage, so you've got the data next to the actual compute. Um, but the fact that they can be clustered so simply in what we call superpods, um, and superpods um, are actually, uh, so superpods and the Ampere chip themselves actually comprise all but the top one of what's called the Green 500. So that is the world's most efficient form of compute. So when you're talking about footprints and um, you know, um, the, the carbon cost, of um, generating and using AI, but also all kinds of scientific computing. Um, 26, point, I think it's 26.4 um, gigaflops per watt is actually the winning. And we were just um, pipped at the post by um, Fugaku, which is um, the, um, the Japanese um, contribution. You can look on Green um, 500 for that. But everything that we do is about how to be the fastest, how to be the most efficient. Um, and obviously, um, for us, we are dealing with all kinds of workloads. It could be um, you know, Amazon's back-end um, recommender system that everybody uses, um, Twitter's newsfeed, um, Facebook's um, entire network runs on GPU-accelerated um, compute. So we have to be the absolute fastest, but I'll get a little bit more into that. Um, as we go along. As I said, this is going to be a bit of a whirlwind and I'll forget half the stuff that I was meant to actually tell you. But um, this is a big issue for me. We should be talking about the most world efficient form of computing all of the solutions that are going to help us to mitigate and adapt um, to climate change. Otherwise, none of it makes sense whatsoever. So the fact that GPUs are already quicker already means that we're saving 
on legacy CPU only um, high performance computing. And that's at world, you know, supercomputer data center, even down to laptop um, side. So we are very, very, very conscious of this. Um, but also something that um, I was talking and, and I've, I've started a conversation with Ian about this. How do we get the data to the data centers in a carbon zero way? And one of them is, you know, we're potentially sitting at the, at the UK's first site for space-based solar arrays. How fantastic would it be for Goonhilly to be receiving beams of energy literally straight from the sun here? And we're really, really far behind China in this technology. So we have to start stepping up. You know, council members are in the room, which is, which is great. This is something that Goon Hilly could actually be receiving. Um, and then it's not only powering, you know, its own data center, but it's also firing that out to, to households. And there's lots and lots of, you know, I could um, talk for hours on just other aspects like regreening sewage works. You know, they literally create enough methane in the process um, to, to power thousands and thousands, tens of thousands of homes. So that's something else that we can do. And sewage works aren't going anywhere, right? So, you know, think of that. So anyway, NVIDIA is not just a gaming company. We're not just a, a, a GPU company either. Um, we have the GPU, of course, um, which, you know, gamers made us um, the company that we are, but we're, we're more visual computing now. Well, we also have our own CPU. We also have what's called a DPU, and that's the data processing unit. So basically the networking moving trillions of operations um, those, those um, sites. Um, but that is to allow major software. 75% of NVIDIA now is, is software. And that's various platforms across all these kinds of um, applications um, and um, workflows, etc. cetera. Um, this morning, all, you know, majority of the conversations we would we're held in that really quite uncomfortable um, feeling of uncertainty, of fear, not really knowing what we're talking about, not really knowing how to actually get an answer, um, how to get a solution to a problem that we actually have. That's called the bleeding edge. Welcome to our world, because this is basically what we have to do. We have to bring all of the technology together and write all the code to work on our hardware to solve thousands and thousands of problems, not just from the big, you know, player Amazon recommender systems, but basically now, and luckily my focus um, has always been on, on space. I've got an astro um, background, but space and climate and what EO and, and a new term that I've just learned this morning, Earth Intelligence, um, EO is Earth Observation, of course, what that can do to actually help us in these really big existential problems. So essentially, this is what we, we bring um, to the table. We bring the entire platform, which is the hardware and the software, but we are constantly having to develop new software because this is the bleeding edge, especially with space and climate. This is absolutely brand new, and we don't yet have the pipelines written to go in, in immediately from satellite to an answer to your problem because you have to go through, and I'm going to um, give you some indication of the complexity of that. But first of all, try to just split AI into, into two um, factors. First of all, you've got the application development side. It's, it's the data prep, which I mentioned this morning, is, you know, can be upwards of, of 80, 90% of the actual workload, especially with supervised learning, where you have to get labeled data and you have to teach a system um, basically, an AI system is just going to learn the patterns that are emerging. And they could be patterns that we will never, ever, as humans, be able to see. But it's able to process millions of lifetimes of experience, so to speak, or data um, in, in seconds. So basically, it's getting that data to, to train the system um, and then create a prototype um, that you then retrain and, and refactor because you've got to tune it. And that's what Google's AutoML code is doing. It's automated. The neural network is now capable of creating its own neural network and the most optimal to actually use it. To then go to what we call inference. And you need the actual infrastructure in place to do the very compute intensive training, but also to be able to get the fastest possible inference. And of course, that's relative to, to the actual application. Um, when we're talking about getting um, 
climate related disaster management right now we do not society as a whole does not have um, the, the technology to be, to go as fast as an SMS notification system um, and and you know I've been party for, uh, to that basically in in the last storm I forget the actual names um, Eunice was it um, my council in Richmondshire decided to because we also had heavy snow that that morning that the storm was arriving they decided that they were going to stop and, and cancel all recycling collections but they had no way to tell anybody that they were going to um, cancel that so an entire community I don't know what happened but uh, you can imagine an entire community put out all their recycling which happened to be empty plastics cans glass onto the side of the street Eunice blows through and you can imagine where all of that recycling, which is so important, ends up, you know, across the countryside, etc. If there is an SMS set up, then you could have instantly notified. And um, they actually use Twitter, but even Twitter is not fast enough. Most people, especially, you know, non-silver surfers, don't have Twitter, wouldn't look on the internet. You know, they, they'd only have word of mouth. So it's, it's really, really important, and I have to focus and, and move on. Basically, the message is that the inference side is really, really hard. It's really, really complex. It's not just the different processes. It's also where you're actually going to um, provide inference. And what I mean is taking new data, putting it in an AI system, and getting insight from that. So getting an, in, uh, an insight into where the next flood is going to happen. Is it going to be... Um, you know, is the application going to be deployed on a drone? Is it going to be deploy, uh, deployed on um, a phone? Is this going to be, a, you know, is it going to have a data center to, um, to, to back it up? But also it has to cover all the many different platforms. There are many different players in this, in this world. Um, especially, you know, focusing in on satellite imagery. You have um, Planet, you've got Maxar, you've got um, NASA and ESA who have their, the, you know, Copernicus and their own satellite fleets. You've got the, the individual players. They all have to um, somehow come in and this whole thing has to be standardised and we are not there yet. That's what I mean by bleeding edge. It's really uncomfortable, it's quite messy, but right now is, is where we start putting down the actual solutions and, and how we actually bring this together. Because even the models themselves, the AI models, there are, you know, 20 plus um, that are probably at the most, you know, in, in research activity of various models, whether or not you're using a convolutional neural network, whether you scrap that now and, and go vision transformers, everything you hear about in speech processing, you know, when you talk to Siri um, or um, when you talk to, you know, the other mobile platforms. Um, all that is natural language processing, and the majority of it is, is, is run by um, transformer architectures. We can now, and this is the pace of it, literally in the past few months, instead of using it for, for sequences, you know, as in the words that I'm speaking, which then go into um, spectrograms and then you know, becomes an image in itself, you can use it directly on images. And it turns out that they're more robust to um, compression, so that's great when you're on a satellite, you need to compress the data to, to downlink it to Earth, but also the, the more um, robust to occlusion. So when, the da when you have cloud cover or when you've got a part that's just, you know, got messed up, like my talk did, you know, it's got corrupted in a, in a, in a file. So this is a really, really complex. This is just Amazon AWS ground stations um, workflow. And I'm not, certainly not going to go through this now, but that's... What I mean by the complexity of going on the left from their satellite down into their S3 buckets, pipe through um, to SageMaker, which is their machine learning library. Um, now, with AWS and with uh, Microsoft Azure and with Google Cloud, we've already integrated all of our GPU accelerated um, inference server technology. So here you can go SageMaker, SageMaker through Triton and get the absolute fastest. But you're still talking about from bucket to the answer that you're looking for, you know, minutes. And, and, and who knows how long it takes for, for the actual satellite itself to revisit a certain area. We're getting better and better. Obviously, defense have the best at the moment, but that's, you know, just how the world works. So we have to rely on the individual um, fleet constellations, who's running them. Um, but the, the tools that we have, and I'm going to give you a whirlwind view of some of them, are 
what will increase the time to insight. So get you the fastest answer possible. Um, and that includes all kinds of code, but it's code that we've already written, code that's available to everyone. Um, in case you, you don't know, all of our code is completely free. It all goes onto what we call the NGC, the NVIDIA GPU Cloud. We do, who knows, NGC, there's so many acronyms in this field. Um, but basically, you just pull that down. It's a simple pull um, command uh, to command line, or we have a user interface. But the code is free, and it comes um, containerized. Go to that link there, accessible to anybody. Um, and it includes things like um, uh, Tau. So Tau, which is train, adapt, optimize. That's a really ongoing, recurring thing to, to get your model as accurate as possible before you deploy it before you take it into, into inference. So that's just one of the many containers that are out there that, that you can simply take. There's also some really cool tools. Um, you may have heard of generative adversarial networks or GANs. This is now, this is essentially the creativity that, that um, AI can, can bring when we're talking about providing really simple tools. Here, it's a very basic, Draw a, draw a doodle, but it's already trained to understand what that should look like in the real world, so natural landscapes. Um, but it's also um, a simple tool that's, that's available to anybody, you know, just go online and, and play with it. Um, you can also now incorporate natural language processing, so you can actually tell it or you can type in, this is what I would like um, to, to draw. And it understands the texture. Of, of pebbles it understands how to you know we've been working in gaming for decades so obviously now this looks really um, clunky and, and silly and all the rest of it but when you're talking about and hopefully I'll I'll explain this as the talk goes on about creating data to train AI systems it's really important um, and it provides you just in, incredible tools to to use I'll come back to that I promise um, but Basically rapid, so any kind of um, traditional data science that has ever been done before, PCA, Random Forest, um, XGBoost, all of those um, techniques that have been used for decades and decades can be made faster. Rapids is um, a community um, network now that, that we started, which, um, and, and these are the three places that you actually go to to, to get that free code where it's applications that have already been done. Um, so moving swiftly on, um, do tell me if I'm waffling because there's no notes here whatsoever. Um, FDL is um, something that I was part of the second that I joined NVIDIA, which was way back in June 2015. So this is essentially all about deploying and com you know, therefore commercializing sp uh, space data. But it's, um, it's basically for all kinds of space science. And as it says here, you know, whether that's for exploration um, or otherwise for humankind. So that covers the whole gamut of um, climate change, mitigation, adaptation, etc. But what it brings to the table is it puts all of the stakeholders and the data owners and the academics in a room and it, it forces them literally to sit there for eight weeks and come up with a prototype. This is all about what's called TRL, tech ready level. Tech really, um, TRL 9 is literally, it's, it's a mission that's going, to, you know, about to be launched into space. So this is um, something, X problem, add AI and make it happen within two months. Now, obviously it is actually a year round effort because then they write the papers that go to the, the top academic um, conferences. The whole thing gets peer reviewed but at this pace, we can bring solutions together. I'm not going to go through all of these, but these are just some of them. Take a look at the, the, the PDF later. And it, and it covers everything from looking for exoplanets. It started with how do we find the city killer um, asteroids? Um, you know, we know where the big ones are, but how do we get the, the ones that, um, well, even the movies are talking about now. Um, but there's lots and lots of other different use cases. That's probably the hardest thing. And again, that bleeding edge um, point that there are hundreds and hundreds of use cases for space data. So this was basically um, FDL. Um, I went to Jensen in 20, 20, 2015 and said, you know, we, we need to get this together. And he said, yeah, here's a pot of cash. NASA now puts in the majority of the actual cash. 
for this, but also stakeholders. And there are big stakeholders here, as you can um, see. Um, Google now provides most of the actual cloud compute, our GPUs, for free, so that the researchers can actually do the, do the work during that eight-week um, hack. Um, and we have all kinds of, of folks like USGS. Um, the US's Department of Energy is now um, part and parcel. They're putting three challenges together and they're sitting down and they want results at the end of that eight weeks. So that's a really good way. Digital um, Twin Earth, this started back in 2020 where um, we do not have the compute today, and I'll talk more about this in a minute, to, um, to compute the entire Earth. Um, but what we can do is we can take subsets. So here, this was basically um, a subset to help predict extreme rainfall, the, the like crop and harvest wrecking um, torrential storms in sub-Saharan Africa. And they came up and they've actually brought together um, a solution um, for that with um, a, it's somewhere between three and five days of uh, warning. So enough time for people to actually harvest crops. Um, this is some of just some of the of the many code that's available online, open to, to everybody. Pyrain um, is um, part of that. This is um, basically um, uh, an image of the ERA5 data, which is ECMM, uh, ECMWF, the European um, Weather Centers um, version. Love to get into that um, a bit more, but there's also AI techniques where you can basically take imagery from the moon, from some, you know, other solar um, location, you know, no, no matter, not just an actual um, body, but a certain location. Take any of that data that we've had, you know, many, many probes and, and satellites go to um, and um, make, sh make it absolutely high resolution. AI can do that. It's a very, very simple technique. And you can also then put that on satellites so that the data that it's bringing isn't going to be coming down in low resolution. Or you can work in low resolution, which means low compute, low footprint, and then up res the actual um, level. We have embedded um, credit card sized GPUs that have been in orbit for, since 2018. This is just one of the partners that we work that ruggedize um, our Jetson units. Um, so Venus itself hasn't been deployed yet because unfortunately we work way too fast for the, the space agencies. You know, NASA takes, takes years to plan a mission. So they're only just testing our um, previous by two version. Um, and that's actually being launched later this year. But the startups are already firing Jetsons. So, uh, so um, intelligent um, craft or CubeSats into orbit and have been for years. So this is just one partner that you can get an actual solution and have it deployed. This is Orbital Sidekick and other partners. So this is hyperspectral imaging. That's um, First of all, they deployed it outside, um, external to the ISS. But now they have their, they're about to launch their own um, fleets. They have US government contracts that basically want hyperspectral imaging um, to, to help with, you know, it could be smart farming, it could be... Um, Obviously, here you can see um, deforestation, but again, that's that hundreds of different use cases. And they have their own fleet of six going up this year, which is just brilliant. So it's this question, how do we actually understand the world? And um, it's very, very complex. There's very, very uh, many moving parts. We have chaos, and I'm, you know, certainly no time to get into the chaos theory of things. But the chaos theory, um, the problem is... We are living in unprecedented times where even now we don't have that much data on the Australian bushfires of 2020 to be able to go back um, and, to, and to make predictions using AI systems. So this is something that we're working on because simulation is the answer. And we've basically been working on this as in gaming for decades. So we're now pulling together all of the different components that we can actually get. And there's a bit more information on that. This is where we're at with um, cloud resolving weather forecasting. Um, so we can, we can just about cope, and this is very state of the art at one kilometre um, resolution. So take that as your one X in, um, in compute. To go climate, you need to couple all of Earth's processes, land, sea, um, air, atmosphere, human activity and you have to couple all of that together um, and literally you have to go not one kilometer but you have to get down to between one and ten meter resolution but unfortunately 
um, the compu itself um, goes eightfold um, per resolution doubling. So what we need is we need brand new computers, we need brand new solvers, numerical solvers, and we need AI's help to go ahead with it. But luckily, GPUs have already brought exascale compute. We already have exascale com computers. Celine is, I think, 4.6 exascale, and she's only number six in the world. Um, obviously, every major government you know, has their own um, facilities. We also have um, software. So Modulus is um, just a framework. It's not a solver in itself, but it's a framework that lets us bring something called physics-informed um, neural networks. And what that means is an AI system can now literally learn the behaviors of actual laws of physics. Um, it's been proven, and you can now use it um, in deployed situations, but only in, in small sort of toy programs. What we haven't done is put it to the scale of Earth size. And what I mean in reality to that is we can't and still can't, um, won't possibly ever need actually to be able to simulate the entire world, but we need to be able to zone in on a geographic location and say, this is potentially what is going to happen in three weeks time, you know, to some, some area of our world and we need to do X, Y, Z. That's basically what we actually need to do. But we can provide the actual compute and the capability with physics-informed neural networks with something called FNO, which I don't have time to get into. It's Fourier neural operators, so we're no longer working on Euclidean scales, so height, width, depth. We're working on Fourier scales. And um, if you think in gaming, the, the, the easiest way to talk about Fourier transforms is that's what we need to, um, uh, to simulate, you know, hair flying in the wind or to simulate water realistically using Fourier scales. But using a Fourier scale versus Euclidean, basically it means you can do it thousand times quicker with much less compute, much lower footprint. Um, and all of these kind of like incremental improvements are happening on almost a weekly basis. And again, you know, it's, it makes my head spin and it's my job um, to keep an eye on it and be able to tell folks about it. Um, but we already have the tools to actually do this, something called graph neural networks. So this is graph, graphs describe social networks, you know, Facebook's written on it, basically. It describes um, roadmaps, transportation networks, satellite networks, as in the communications between, can all come down to graphs. And graph neural networks, basically, you, it can be used to, for a ton of things. At the moment, the main um, applications are in drug discovery because it can, at a molecular level, um, give us some more insight into the best um, composition of, of drugs that are going to be the most successful. So, you know, forget throwing away billions and 10 years in time. We can now give X, Y, Z, try those, make those in a lab. Um, but fraud detection as well, cryptography is a huge area. We have a library that will help you write that. Just go online and actually get it. We call it DGL. Um, I'm skimming through this very, very quick. With cryptography, and this comes into play, thanks, with cryptography, this comes into play with satcoms, with the security that we actually need. Um, so Goonhill is part of um, Moonlight, which is, is it three, three or four satellites, I think, that are basically going to give us round-the-clock relay um, to um, around the dark side of the moon back to Earth so that when we start building the moon base next year, which is going to happen, fingers crossed, um, we have an, an adequate um, communication relay link, but it needs to be secure. Everything that we're sending um, you know, to the ISS and back right now um, is one thing, but we are now going to start in the next 10 years, we'll have commercial space stations because the ISS will be decommissioned in 2030. Um, and there's going to be a number of commercial and privately owned space stations. So think what we have here on Earth and the, the security that we need here on Earth, especially at a cryptographic level with the internet, everything has to be equally secure for when we start the moon base and beyond because you know we're not just going to stay on earth anymore so basically you can use ai inference instead of heuristics widely used um, so um, any kind of sensor telemetry and you can think of every satellite we you know that's up there in orbit as a sensor um, it's important to think that way actually because it combines ai um, everything you hear about iot you know internet of things and everything being connected with the adequate um, compute platform 
but also everything that, um, that, that we have, and that includes the DPU that I mentioned, because that provides security as you're passing the data um, in between, um, and what we call Triton, which is our inference server, and um, you can learn more about that later. So the um, cryptography platform that we have is called Morpheus. If you want to find out some more information about it, that's the link. Um, I wish I had more time to get into that, but I don't. But the one big um, profound um, part of AI as a whole and everything that, that, that I do for, for, you know, for a living in, in my life comes down to now to simulation. And the funny thing is, obviously, you can think of it as gaming. Has anybody ever used a, a Microsoft Word um, document? Uh, sorry, a, a Google document that Microsoft Word do it as well. Used a Google Doc where you go online um, and you make changes and you could have a collaborator who's in the next office or they could be across the other side of the earth. They're also making changes. So think about that. That's the internet in 2D. What we're doing is we're bringing, and there's many other players involved, obviously, but, you know, I work for NVIDIA, so I'm talking about Omnibus. Um, we are making um, the next stage, which is going 3D. So the internet is all 2D overlay right now. Everything is moving 3D. So when I talk about virtual worlds, it's nothing uh, more crazier than using a Google Doc for the collaboration side, as well as um, gaming. And if anybody has ever you know, done gaming, I, I have never played a game, a video game in my life, but I understand virtual worlds because my charity's got a virtual office. Um, so it, it kind of comes natural. But what you can also do is you can build digital twins. And we've heard about digital twin Britain, UK, I think. I hadn't, I hadn't heard of, um, of that earlier. Um, digital twins can be of all kinds of things, not just planet Earth, but it could be a digital twin of a factory so that you can actually, in um, a safe um, prototype environment, design the most optimized place. So Omniverse is basically bring all the people, bring all of your collaborators. They could be on the other side of the world, but it's all connected by a way. To a digital world. But one of the really important things is this is just um, an example of some of the image and sc or screenshots even that you can pull from these virtual worlds that provides unlimited synthetic data as you're actually running the actual digital twin itself. So data is now no longer an issue. You can use GANs to generate the data if you haven't got sufficient data because it can come up with all the corner cases. Um, for example, um, Modulus that I mentioned before, which is that um, Fourier scale AI and physics informed neural networks can be pulled into a virtual world um, and help to design the most optimal um, plant we work with um, with Siemens who needed um, help in optimizing the cooling systems in some of their, their plants. So we built a digital world, or rather they did, and we helped. Um, this is just some of the um, things that you can do with Omniverse. This is BMW's digital twin. It, this isn't their facility, their actual facility. This is a digital twin where you can pull in CAD, Computer Ready Design. You can pull in virtual you can pull in, these are synthetic people. So basically they can build this. This is self-driving cars. The entire network of self-driving cars anywhere in the world is built using simulated data coupled with the real world. This is partners using it for architectural design. We've been using virtual worlds to, to design cars and, and buildings for years and, and now even entire smart cities. But also um, satcoms, but obviously more ground-based First of all, you can use them to design telecom networks and you can test them in telecom networks. I'm pretty sure I'm running short on time, so I'm going to have to speed up here and just run through that. Um, but this is just um, one of the many um, specific application chips that we have, and it's called a converged accelerator. So it's a GPU that also has the, the Bluefield DPU on it to provide in the secure comms um, for when you're talking about um, 5G um, radio area networks, um, when you're talking about bringing AI into a 5G network, when you're talking about having security-based systems, for example. So this is a specific chip that's built and, and is being deployed. And you can actually get, sorry, I flicked over that. You can get developer kits, so the actual you know, test hardware um, online. There's some resources there for it. 
this is some work that we did with um, with Ericsson. So, um, you know, individual cell towers and, and mapping it out in a digital world um, so that they could test um, uh, signal strength, essentially, due to the buildings. This is um, physically accurate, not just gaming anymore. This is um, physically accurate, even down to the to the height of the trees that, that you can see here. Obviously, this is just a still image, but um, I'll, uh, I'll show you some things in a minute. But beam forming can um, physically accurately be even calibrated and tested in digital worlds. So they use these digital worlds before they deploy, before they actually spend the, the, you know, the, the money on putting the towers in place in, uh, in areas and in, in facilities. Um, there's, we have another product called Aerial, which is um, specifically for AI on 5G, and there's a dev kit there. But everything to do with using Omniverse for digital twins, you just simply need a GPU, whether you're running it from a laptop or a workstation or in specific servers. Um, and there is hundreds of tutorials online. Do go online and actually have a play. This is um, a shot that I wanted just to remind everybody that we're not talking about um, bleeding edge in the sense that this has never been done before. Every, every tiny component of development in self-driving cars is done with either a f with both a fleet of actual physical cars um, doing the doing the miles on the street. You know, Google's mapped billions of miles with their, with them um, with their simulation, but only um, probably I don't know, maybe five hundred thousand miles with actual cars. It has to be coupled with virtual digital um, copies, um, and what I mean by that is simulated cars. So we use these virtual worlds to actually um, drive virtual cars around virtual streets that have to be physically realistic, otherwise it, it, it doesn't matter because it, it's going to be wrong and people are going to die, literally. So it's not like we haven't been doing this for years. What, the only thing that's, keeping us, that's holding us back right now is regulation. You know, obviously there, there are Teslas on the road, etc., but they're, they're not using you know, the, anything like level five. They're at level two slash slash three. But simulated data and use of um, digital worlds is really, really important. And some of the hardware behind it are in. The, the real problem we have, again, is we work way too quick for the majority of industry and especially the space industry to, to, to react. This is our latest embedded and Orin is part of the hardware that goes into the self-driving car on the road but it's also um, part of the, the simulated version. So you're coupling digital twins along with the real world. If you want to test or try any of it, we now have something called Launchpad, where we've got all of these centers around the world where we can provide you know, at, at least the kind of um, coverage that your average cloud suppliers do. But every major cloud has GPUs anyway. Um, but if you need some a free two weeks, just, just let me know. Um, aside from that, that was a ton of information. Like I said, I'll, um, I'll provide the, a PDF of, uh, of, the, of the, the slide so you can spend a bit more time on it. But we do do um, what's called the Deep Learning Institute. So that's hands-on, playing with code um, and um, using GPUs that are in the cloud, actually with AWS, on hundreds of different applications. So just some of them here. You can go to nvidia.com DLI to get more info on that. Or I can get you a free code so you can access them because... Um, they start from about $30 for a self-paced course, but that's because um, they're running on GPUs in the cloud and AWS charges us. Um, so that's there. Um, and if you do nothing else from the talk that I've flown through today, please sign up to, um, to the developer zone because then we can keep you informed on everything that we're actually doing. And it's constantly, you know, my, my job is, is never dull, definitely. And if you're a startup, join up to Inception is completely free and we give you all kinds of support from marketing even to, to venture capital and um, putting you um, in, in the room with some of the, the big Silicon Valley money and the big London money. Um, we also have a very big conference next, uh, next month, so if you want to know more. Thank you very much. I think I'm over time, but if there's any questions. Thank you very much, um, Alison. That was really, really interesting. Um, we have one question online, but we we'll probably expect we've got some questions here. So I'll read it to you. Um, the question is, uh, pins are really game changers for many engineering problems. Do you see any direct examples with respect to Earth observation applications? Yep, um, we're, we're working on it right now. Go to.
QTC because there's some demos and I can't say too much about it because it would know, give the uh, give the game away. But um, we're um, we're working on things like um, I can say optimization, but that doesn't really uh, mean anything. Um, climate change. I mean, the thing the thing about physics informed neural networks is um, you combine it with um, the the FNO paper came out. So um, one of our um, um, chief researchers, um, Annie Marr, is also a professor at Caltech. Um, the, the, a huge hive mind of, of people that um, that um, you know are included in my um, network of colleagues, and they are actually the majority. We, we spoke earlier about the um, bringing together the cross collaboration of industry and, and academia. You will find today, you know, Nvidia is not alone in the fact that um, a vast amount of, of people that work there are academics. You know, they're at least PhD grade, if not professors, you know. So it's those same people. And they're all putting their heads together specifically for things like climate change right now. And so um, PINs, Physics Informed Neural Networks, which essentially are capable, actually capable of learning laws of physics. Um, and if you understand partial differential equations, basically um, the, the stuff that we don't understand, we approximate in, um, across science. Um, so anything that uses partial differential equations, that could be fluid dynamics, which of course think everything about the atmosphere, atmospheric rivers, for example, giving the game away there. Um, but um, the, there'll be demos um, at GTC, that, um, but any asset that uses um, numerical solvers today, and that's pretty much most of, of science, um, it comes down to, again, we're not having AI replace this. It's going to help to actually bring even better, more accurate. And the thing about resolution is the higher the resolution, um, think about zooming into a photograph and it doesn't become blurry. That's what we mean by having resolution. So if we can get to one meter resolution, that is all of the uncertainty gone in every question that we can think about with climate change, making a prediction about climate change. We just have to put the components together and you know, destiny, which is the European Union's um, solution, uh, you know, their digital twin of Earth is going to be their first phase ends by 2024. And then they start ramping it up to be able to do entire earth and we're working with them so brilliant Lots. thank you anyone else have any questions in the room Alison hi um thanks for the great talk I wanted to ask about uh, super resolution in particular and yep. um I've read some papers on it and I struggle to understand I suppose the limitations of the robustness of it like how maybe this is too technical no no it's fine it's fine um but I was distracted by it. Is it, is it, by, is it yeah. a twofold scaling that we can expect from sort of top line algorithms? At, at least twofold. Data, much higher? Are we like 20 folds? Like, the, it, again, it, it depends on the application because, um, <coughs> for example, if you take uh, moon imagery, I mean, we've got the Apollo archives and they were pretty high resolution anyway. Um, but a lot, of, um, a lot of the problems we have with um, deep space missions is, um, is resolution. So how do you quickly take a... Um, a low resolution and move it to high resolution. So, so GANs, for example, can help because they can literally um, create the data to train the system so that it's looking. But then you start freaking out thinking, well, that's, that's not real data, so how does that work? What you're doing is you're training a system to understand certain behaviours. So, you know, it could be the lunar landscape or um, if, for example, it's a super resolution of an image, you know, somebody's trying to sell... A, a, an image resolution application, then obviously you need the absolute best image resolution because nobody's going to pay you to, to you know, bring a, a, a fuzzy, blurry image and make it into, you know, I mean, there's millions of defense contractors would, you know, pay billions for it. But you have to have it exact. But it comes down, I'm, I'm not really answering the question because it comes down to the application. But you can certainly go, you know, at least um, twofold simply because you, you, you can use AI in, in, in you know, the respect that uh, the example I showed you, which is GAN. Um, GAN Verse, we, that's another tool that we have where you can go instantly from a 2D photo or 2D image to a 4D model, like, you know, four-dimensional model from a simple um, image. Um, and that includes the, the super res that's needed to go to, to that. But if you work at low res, 
you don't need as much compute, it doesn't take as much time. So it's important to actually be able to use low res, but be able to up res the actual output, the, the, you know, the end result. So it really depends how much you can do. But it all comes down to just training a system to, to know exactly what it should look like so that when you feed in actual data that you need an actual answer from, not just, you know, create this kind of thing, it will give you a, you know, ni hopefully 99 point something percent accurate result and not, you know, something that's shoddy. But actually some applications don't mind shoddy because that's way better than they ever had, you know, before. So it, it comes down to the specifically on what you're working on, but definitely. Brilliant. Were there any more questions? Okay, any Go on. Yeah, okay. Just that. Were comments actually. So, Alison, thanks for that mind blowing um, uh, presentation on, on the work that uh, that Infidio is doing. It, 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 it is really incredible. And, and you know, some of the techniques that we're, we're saying about the physics informed uh, machine learning is, yep. I, I think, really the, the direction we need to go. But I think you, you said it yourself as, as you were talking. I was thinking, you know, Infidio is a hardware company and a software company but you, your software is all free. So, mm -hmm. so as, as a company, you, you, you make your money by selling the hardware. hardware. Yeah. We all need to be able to engage, and, and I think you know, we've started the process with you to, to, to learn, and the inception program is, is great. But I think that you, you are, you're, you're, uh, you know, you, you're, you're going at such a speed that we all need to find it, a It's way. actually AI that's going at the speed, and yeah, that's the we, entire community <laughs> of researchers that are pushing us, so, you know. But, but we, we need to find a way to, to, to keep up uh, and to, to buy your products and, and use them. And so, courtesy of, of Melvin here, <laughs> we've got a great... Um, well, sign up to DevZone for a start, because that's just an email list where we'll keep telling you exactly what we're working on. But FDL is a great program, if you, you because we don't mess about with this. Um, you know, no offence to any academic, you know, that's the only reason I'm in this job is because of academia. Um, but we, we don't have time, you know, to spend three or four years on, um, on a solution anymore. We need to have something in place in the next year. You know, we need to have a digital twin earth will still take until, you know, maybe 2025. Um, but we're already seeing, you know, the problems um, that are existing today. So we need a fast way to prototype with the big players on board and that includes the tech companies, but also defense contractors, people who you know, will put money into it, but the academics. And it, FDL is all about the, the PhD students that come on and are paid to give up their entire summers to code a solution to a problem that is very, very relevant today. You know, that at, at the moment it's either driven by NASA's missions, and a lot of that is obviously you know, climate adaptation. Um, and, um, and also we have FDL Europe, which works with ESA, and that's the reason that I you know, first met um, Ian and, and knew about um, Goonhilly. Um, but it's space and climate that I'm particularly focused on. So if you need help, let me know. We have, NVIDIA has programs for academics that will provide um, hardware and funding if you are commercializing it. Um, but there's also free hardware grants uh, programs like twice a year, I think. You know? And we'll talk to you more about that. And as I said, Melvin is just at uh, courtesy of, of Leeds University, we work closely with, has funded a couple of more uh, GPUs, uh, NVIDIA GPUs that arrived yesterday. Uh, and so, you know, it so adds to our students. We, we want to work with the community to, 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 to really enable people to, to develop tools and, and, uh, and commercialize them. So, uh, Happy to help. Anyway, and I went to Leeds, so I <laughs> <laughs> brought the T-shirt. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, uh, Alison, for that talk. Okay, I'll yeah. unplug him. Right now. Thank you. Oh, so the uh, next session now is a panel discussion, um, which can be run by Andy Williams for the European Sp Space Agency, with four businesses from the southwest, talking about how they've commercialized um, data using AI. So over to you, Andy. You've got a seat if you want. You've got to use a seat. Just a seat. That can work. All right, it was just a backdrop, but all right, can't get it to work for some reason. Oh, I don't know what's going on that. <coughs> 
just unplug it. Right. <coughs> cool. Over to you. So is that, that I can use that mic there. That mic should be on. Oh, it's there. What? Yeah, but This isn't a fireside chat, this is a panel. I, I don't really know what the difference is between a fireside chat and a panel. It doesn't feel as warm somehow. Um, okay, so the focus of this now is really talking about commercialization of AI data and really looking at the challenges around getting to the point where you can commercialize uh, you know, uh, the use of, of, of AI. I mean, um, Obviously, we're looking at it from a space perspective, but I'm sort of going to try and be broader and say generally, you know, if, uh, how can we use artificial intelligence? How can we use sort of digital innovation? But what are the challenges around commercializing that? And it's an ugly word and it's been used already, so let's say it again, monetization. How can we monetize, you know, the, these, these, these innovations? And, and really, you know, you've got to look at the, the sort of long-term commercial sustainability of these things. Um, and the only real way of, of doing that is being able to actually uh, monetize those applications. Okay, so that's what we're going to talk about over the next next period. Before we really delve into that, what I want everybody to do is just introduce themselves, say who they are, who they work for, and and just very quickly what what the organisation is about. Yeah, but let's not delve yet into the the so-called commercialization challenges. Okay, so we'll start with with, with you, Chris. Chris, yeah, well, hello everybody. I'm Chris Roberts, so I'm a, a founding partner and shareholder at Aspia Space. Uh, and we were formed really to uh, address one of the problems that's come up a couple of times already today, which is addressing the problem of cloud cover with Earth observation. So, um, what we do very simplistically is we allow unprecedented regular cloud free access to Earth observation data. And we do this by using a very clever AI algorithm that is a patent algorithm developed by us um, and we can do this across multiple sites anywhere on the globe <clears throat> and um, what it really does is it allows people to gain insight into the conditions on the ground far more regularly um, but more importantly also kind of unlocks that, um, uh, that, that, that data, historical data that has been sort of cloud covered so if you look at things like the ESA archive it allows you to start to gain some historical insight and then from that make some predictions around trends uh, moving forwards. Um, and then really the value that we have is not so much the data, which is incredible and interesting, but also it's access to our um, a sort of team of data scientists led by Professor Jim Geach, who's a, a, a professor of astrophysics at the University of Hearts, ably supported by Luke, gives the wave Luke. Uh, who's in our newly opened offices in Tremo, and we could do all of this even if there is a hundred percent cloud cover. Okay, great. Yeah, Anthony, over to you. So, Anthony Peake, um, Chief Executive of Intelligent AI. Uh, we're an insure tech, um, so we work with insurers to. We we use the term digital twins. We build a digital twin of risk. So we bring together three hundred different pieces of data to any commercial property that's open data, that's taking 60 to 80 page unstructured risk reports that engineers have written, t pulling the core data out of that for into dashboards, but also using satellite image analysis to be able to identify the building materials uh, and to value buildings from space. So insurers today pretty much make all of their decisions on 10% of the data. In the UK, they underwrote 50 billion of insurance in the last five years, uh, and they lost 4.7 billion on that, because insurance is gambling with very poor data. We're changing that to being very precise data and building a 360 degree model of all the data you need about building. Great, superb. Okay, up to Chris. Uh, yep, yeah, so I'm Chris, I'm from Bluefruit Software. Um, uh, we're not actually an AI company. Um, we're um, an embedded software company um, up in Redruth. Uh, what we do is, is outsource um, our software engineering teams. We've got um, about seven or eight teams right now um, to companies that are looking to create products. Um, about two years ago, uh, we had some aerospace 
funding from Cornwall Aerospace, um, and we use that funding to help um, increase our knowledge of AI and AI systems. Um, so we started out with um, looking at audio, very humble beginnings of the Hoover, and um, we did something very similar to uh, what we were showing earlier in terms of uh, the jungle and collecting audio and categorizing it and, uh, and all of that. Um, and we took it to a commercial partner um, and we said, you know, we've done this, how, look how good it is. Uh, and they said, well, our factories, you know, are very noisy and very busy. Um, how could we overcome that? We don't really want to uh, spend more money on adding sensors. So um, we've been developing a way of um, what we call uh, vir using virtual sensors, which is using uh, elect the electronics that are already in the system to um, and processing that through uh, an AI um, to be able to give uh, diagnostic outputs, basically. Um, so yeah, that's blueprint on what we've been doing. Cool. And finally, Michael. Hi everyone, I'm Michael Hanley. Um, I'm from 4F Intelligence. I run our Cornwall cool office. We've also got our main office up in Bristol um, and a couple of other offices dotted about. Um, we are a satellite Earth observation company and our core mission is using space data for the betterment of humans and the planet. Um, essentially what we do is we try and find a client problem and we align um, the data to create a solution. Um, some examples of where we've used AI and machine learning um, is in our European Space Agency. I'm going to plug that because I'm on Andy's panel. But um, uh, we used um, very high resolution Airbus data. We also played with Planet and Maxar data um, to count every vehicle in a city um, and classify it as small, medium, large, static, um, moving or parked. And what that did is, um, as Gavin uh, mentioned earlier, when you talk about um, creating a, uh, a, um, the inputs for an air quality model, we used that as the input for a CMAC model that um, predicted urban air quality. And we did that for 50 European cities so that you could improve and get to hyper-local scale with um, air quality models. Um, that would only ever be possible with artificial intelligence and machine learning. It's, yeah, we don't have the time to draw little boxes around cars and say whether they're um, you know, moving or static or whatever. Um, equally, another um, use of machine learning in our company is um, in the use of hyperspectral data. So we've got projects that use, um, in this case, drones, drone mounted sensors that collect hyperspectral information to understand soil contamination in sites. Um, that's incredibly dense data. It's at the altitude we're flying, it's five centimeters and it's um, picking up 490 spectral bands within that particular sensor. Um, the only way we can analyze such quantities of information and get a meaningful result is using machine learning techniques like random forest and and so on so yeah that's a potted history of 4 ei and actually some of the ai applications that we're using okay good right so what, what i want to do now is 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 talk a little bit more around the the challenges around com commercialization of, of the application so you've talked a little bit about what, what each of your applications are but I want to now sort of delve into the business cases that are able to, to, to an, enable you as organisations to be commercially sustainable. So it's all very well having a widget and saying this widget is fantastic, this widget does this, this and this. Well, that's great. What, what about the market and, and what about the, 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 you know, the, the folks that you're trying to sell it to? And what are the, the challenges really around, uh, 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 around the business case? As we saw in the last presentation by NVIDIA, which was fantastic, by the way, you know, your business case is all around it's selling the hardware, you know, and, and, and the business case and the commercialization is all through the hardware. So that's what I'm interested in understanding now. How can you make a business about what it is you do? What, and, and actually, let's widen it out to, to Bluefruit as well in terms of what you do, because it isn't just focused on you know AI data it's a little bit wider for you but if, if we go first through each each point and say you know what are the challenges that you see in terms of uh, being able to turn it into a business case that's that's commercially viable uh, well I think you know first of all 
you have to treat it like any other business, right? So you have to, it's all about kind of market validation. Just don't get too excited about the technology. I remember when I first sort of heard about this ability to see through cloud, it seemed almost superhuman, seemed almost impossible. How could this happen? Um, and then it took me probably six months to really understand the application thereof. Um, and so it's, you know, in terms of um, monetizing it and turning it into a product that is useful, the most important thing is to first sort of understand what your product does, to then go out and do your market research to understand who's got a problem with a sufficient weight that you can charge a, a premium to deliver a solution to their problem. Mm. Yeah, good. Now, Anthony, I mean, your, your, your market is a great market because there's money in it. It's in the, in the insurance market. <laughs> and they're losing it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, any, anything sort of generally in the financial sector is, is quite a, I, 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 Working with ESA, you know, they're, they're always keen on seeing applications coming in, you know, that are in, in sectors which are, which are generally a little bit more sort of say cash rich. Mm -hmm. so, so can you give us a, a view from that position? Yeah, I mean, it's a, a non-satellite related AI one is the reading of unstructured documents. So they'll send out a risk engineer to maybe 10% of a portfolio. It could be 3,000 hotels worldwide. It could be 500 ports worldwide. It could be film studios, apartment blocks, you name it. They'll send out a risk engineer to maybe um, you know, one in 10 of those. The bigger, the uglier, the more complex. Um, and they will create a 60, 80 page unstructured document. Every human writes differently. Every human describes things differently. They lay them out differently. Each organization lays them out differently. And then a risk engineer has to spend about two hours uh, consuming all of that and understanding what it is in order to underwrite it. Um, that's gonna cost the organization a couple of hundred pounds. Um, and you can use AI to, extra, you know, to, to image analysis of tables, pull out what's the building worth, what's the stock, what's the plant, what's it made of, what's the flooding risk, da, da, da. pull all of that out, put it into a dashboard, rag status, red, amber, green. They can consume that information in minutes. On the other hand, uh, an underwriter will uh, maybe has five minutes to consume that 80 page document. They're gambling. You know, they're basically looking at the summary at the beginning, which misses half the detail, and then they're underwriting billions of pounds worth. So, so that's an example where using AI to read documents, extract data, lay it out very cleanly. And also you then create data lakes, which you can then do benchmarking in industries and plan new models, etc. With satellite, 79% um, of commercial property is underinsured by at least 30%. Because in trying to define what this building is worth, it's sort of in this area, it's about this size, it's about this, made of about this stuff, and it's used for about this. So it's all assumed data. So what we're doing uh, with AI and with satellite is to actually analyse it's exactly this height, it's exactly this area, the space around it, so that I can bring in jumper trucks and things and clear out. I've got all of that. So with very accurate data, it also, to, for someone to do a building analysis, takes them an hour and 20 minutes. I, I do time and motion studies on this yeah. stuff. Um, yeah, and, and, um, and it takes two weeks to get a report to a client, therefore people don't really get these reports, therefore they undervalue the insurance. And so you can do this stuff in seconds and you can do it to very high precision. And when you use satellite, you can do it globally. I don't have to use open data and other sources on the ground. I can train it. And quite often I talk to insurers about cladding. And even four years after Grenfell Tower, they will say, does anyone know where all the cladding is? So obviously our bet, our gamble is, is that with AI, with satellite, we can not only identify the building material, but all the things stuck on top of them as well. So I think there's also parametric insurance. Yep. It's a, a big opportunity for Earth observations. So you're starting to see that Planet and ISI are partnering people like Swiss Re yep. and parametric insurance. You probably be able to give a better definition than I can, but this is where you pay out on a set of triggered events rather than retrospectively yeah, I mean, doing a do, doing a claim. So what they can do, so potentially if you're in a hurricane season, or sorry, you know, or a flooding in the wherever, uh, they will once you've hit, I don't know, three inches of rainwater, or the the wind has hit X mile now, they'll start to put, trigger out on payments. So you can start to use Earth observation to inform you on when that's going to happen, likely to happen, and just be a bit more efficient on your prediction. Yeah, if, if, a, um, if a building's been hit by hail and damaged the roof, then there's normally an IoT sensor within half a mile of that building, and I can, get a, I can see the temperature drop consistent with hail. Tick in the box. 
the great thing about satellite, it's almost like being able to rewind history. I can go back a couple of days, I can go back a week, I can go back four years if I want to, and I can see what the state of that building was before and after the event, and I can subtract one from the other, I know exactly the percentage of damage. I don't have to send out a human, I don't have to burn fossil fuels in a car. I can do it remotely, I can do it faster, the customer's happier and the insurer saves money. Okay, good. So, I mean, you, you've got a really nice example there where you're really adding value to, to the customer. The customer can understand what it is you're doing. Brilliant. You know, that, that way is a great way of being able to commercialise what it is you offer. So, Chris, I want to move to you next, which is really a different sort of thought process here because you're, you're selling sort of software <laughs> service provision, let's say. You know, it's, it's, so, so can you maybe talk through how, 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 what's your commercial business model to make to make sure you can be sustainable over the, over the long term? Right, yeah. Challenges around that. Yeah, so um, with, um, I guess, with our AI, we um, approach uh, it like another tool in our toolbox, basically, um, uh, of all the things. So we only would use AI if it's the right solution for our client's problem, um, I think, is, is the main thing there. Um, and some of those problems include um, with the edge AI that we're working on is that they, they don't want to, you know, they don't want to use um, NVIDIA services and connect to the cloud. They want it to be um, on board calculations. They don't want the data going anywhere. They want to hold it privately, uh, you know, in, in their company, and they want it to be um, able to do it on the chip so the devices don't need to be connected to anything, basically. So um, they're, they're some of their, their problems. I guess one of the challenges for us is um, finding um, clients that are willing to risk, you know, potentially large sums of money on um, looking into uh, AI as a technology because we can't guarantee that we'll start working on it and we can't guarantee that you'll, it will work um, and the data that they have is good enough to create a good model. So, um, and we mitigate that risk through um, our lean agile processes. So we um, often, um, we, we work in two week sprints um, from a commercial perspective. So every two weeks we're getting feedback and we're able to give them quick and rapid feedback whether or not that it looks like their model is going to work or it's not going to work. So they don't end up spending a million pounds on something that doesn't work. They only end up spending a much smaller amount. Um, One thing I've got to ask you actually is when you say they, I mean your, your, your market could be any market is that is that right you're not specifically focused on one particular market sector yeah so you? i mean you're you're yeah you're yeah providing. yeah so we we work the range of sectors um the way that we we offer um high quality software so we work with clients that want the highest quality software in the products that often means that we work in highly regulated sectors um, such as um, aerospace, and um, we do a lot of work in the medical device space. Um, and getting AI into the medical device world is really interesting yeah. uh, with the um, level of compliance that's required. And I guess that's something for the space industry as well as we continue to, to use AI and use models, you know, how will uh, compliance evolve over that period of time. But yeah, we, we, we work in a, in a range of sectors which, um, is helpful for our clients because um, we can pull from um, our experience in various sectors um, and pull in that knowledge that we have to help you know, specific sectors like the space industry, for example. Mm, okay, good. All right, thanks. Michael, I'm gonna come to you slightly at a tangent here. <laughs> Get ready. So when we were, if we looked at the space industry generally sort of 10, 20 years ago, all the big players in the space industry commercially were all the sat, uh, all coming from the satcom world so the intel sats the inmar sats the utel sats and things like this so they, these are all the big companies you didn't have any earth observation you know, you know s service providers are actually making money from earth observation okay that was the case sort of you know going back decades yeah now all of a sudden you're starting to see that change and there are companies out there that are making money from earth observation yeah and and you know you're 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 not sending satellites up yourself as 4ei but you are utilizing uh you know uh, earth observation data uh commercially to, to sustain a business so what, what, what 
I'd just be interested in your take on that. You know, how are you? Uh, how do you think that's that's that? Why has that happened more recently? That you know, companies that are working more in the Earth observation space are now able to make make money. I'd be interested if anybody else wants to pick that up as well. <coughs> what do you think, Chris? Um, yeah, that is tangential. Um, <laughs> <Yes>. so, <laughs> It just came to me, you see. I'm so sorry. It's all right. It's all right. Um, you know, what you've described there is uh, the downstream space sector, basically. And um, essentially, it's now the provision of space data, i.e. Earth observation data, has shifted from government-owned platforms and so on to um, private companies and... Um, and the government sectors, which are um, the government satellites, such as the Sentinels and Landsat, which are persistently collecting. Um, and then you've got the very high resolution solutions from Airbus Planet, Maxar, <coughs> and a lot of the um, disruptive platforms like Capella, GHG Sat, which are providing more niche services. And yes, they want to provide services themselves a lot of the time, but their primary focus is on the getting the platform up there, making sure that it's good enough and making sure that it beats um, their competitors. The reason we're able to make build businesses from that is because we're the ones going in and talking to the clients and aligning the data to their problem. Mm. And, you know, I'm lucky enough to go last and sort of, basically I would parrot everything everyone else has said, that it's about having a problem, making sure that problem is acute enough and um, then working with your in a client focused manner in an agile way and not just going here's here's the solution buy it's about saying does that work for you what else can we do um, but I think what we're going to see more of in our sector to develop on the answer is you know we're a projects company we go in and we speak to our clients and we provide bespoke projects based on their requirements that's great it's not scalable we need to shift to a to become a product company in terms of you know in the way that a lot of the traditional tech companies and the unicorns have in terms of saying how can we create something that's scalable transactional clip and ship or the client even better the client goes on our website buys it and goes away because that's what the big that's what airbus and and all the the, the satellite commercial satellite vendors have done they don't mm. have to bother analyzing that data anymore because people come to them to buy it um, but we've got to take that value that they've created and climb the value chain by adding more and more detail to it. And a lot of that detail is unlocked through artificial intelligence and other things like that. Hopefully I yeah. managed to answer the question. Bang on. Great. Does anybody else want to add anything? Yeah, I mean, I, I, mean, I think it's interesting. I mean, I, I mean, to sort of echo what you're saying, right? I mean, productizing your service, almost becoming a part of someone else's OEM offering is a very good way of, uh, of offering scale. Um, you know, so if you look at what Aspia Space does, really we want a technology that's applicable to multiple use cases, but people will take that image and that data and they will utilise that within their own service offering. But then the value that we add, I think you still have a, you know, there's still value in offering the tuning of that, allowing people to make the best use of that data and apply it to a, a commercially viable problem. Um, so I think that's a really good point. I think the second point is really interesting. You've got that kind of infrastructure builder, infrastructure operator thing, where whether it's building a railway or building a telecoms network, the people who built these things generally go bust, and the people who operate them are the people who, who make the make the money out of them, right? <laughs> Um, and that's why you see people like, and this is why, again, you know, one of the things, I'm sorry, slightly off topic, is you, know, you need to be constantly innovating and testing your product and developing new ways of applying your knowledge. Because, you know, at the moment, um, Aspia, uh, you know, trains our algorithm on Central One data, okay, so that our cloud free imagery works predominantly on Central One data. Now, um, we have to look at, you know, is it, sensible or, or you know have we got time at the moment to train on other satellite image providers but we've also got to be sensitive to the fact that these guys because their, their margins are being squeezed because the market moves so quickly are also moving downwards into our space so planet isi are also offering a whole suite of other solutions based on data analysis and utilization of ai to try and come and start to pick over our area which is that value add yeah. Okay, good. 
you just, no, I was just going to add one, one more topic yeah, after this. So. I was just going to add that, that I, I, although it's accelerating, I still think we're in the early stage. I mean, in, mm. in insurance, there's a lot of digital transformation that's going on. And so they know, even no matter how flawed the current data is, they can at least trust it because that's how they've done business. So, you know, I, in the next three to five years, we will be moving to spectrum analysis and the machine says there's a risk or there isn't a risk. And you don't need the human engaged image to be able to look at it. But today we need the, the image for people to trust it to move. So I think it'll accelerate even faster when people move beyond that needing to see it and just let the rag status tell them. Oh, good, okay. So I've got one more one more main question to ask all of you, and then I think I'll open it up then to, to anybody who wants to uh, bring anything up. So my, my next point is all around uh, funding and investment. So I wanted to sort of just ask you all, you know, ha ha can institutional, so public sourced funding help and how? Where, where is the best place for, for that type of funding to be used? And then what about private investment and... I'm not only thinking there about venture capitalists and things like this, but like earlier we talked about big companies like Shell and things like this. So, mm -hmm. so let's look at sort of public source funding, not versus, but but yeah. you know pri private source funding and when they're best um, utilised within a commercial sort of uh, 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 you know sphere. So, so e each of you be able to. to so, so public in the there. sense of investment from people like ESA or yeah, so or, or from Space Cornwall or yeah, Innovate these it. sorts of things. So, so there's <coughs> early R and D funding from the likes of Aerospace yeah. Cornwall, and then later commercial based funding from the likes of ESA. That's well, well, we can certainly speak to uh, R and D funding. So, so Aspia, um, you know, was awarded a fairly significant amount of money from Space Cornwall, which we're very grateful for which has helped us really sort of propel forward the next stage of our product development. And that's super important. But I mean, one, one interesting thing about that, and I don't know if everyone knows this, it's, to, it, it's funding of the last resort. And that doesn't mean you're about to go pop, but it means that you have to go and look at every other avenue of funding before you go down that avenue of public funding. So you need to be able to demonstrate that you have considered other forms of, um, of funding before you can actually get an award. So it's very critical to us. So we, we went through the, the path initially of you know, private funding, and then um, which we had some initial funding, and then for particularly specifically for that R&D project, uh, we did look at other methods of doing that, but the most appropriate one ultimately was Space Cornwall. Um, but then, so, and it's also very important to understand that is also match funding. So this isn't somebody giving you a chunk of money and you go off and do a project. Um, what it does is you have to go out and you have to have to pay for those um, work packages and then that is funded back to you up to 50% of, of that funding. So it's really useful, but it's only appropriate where you've also got the funding and the ambition to go and push forward with that, that project. Okay, thanks. Yeah, I think it, from our side, we've been fortunate. We've had about half a million of right. Innovate UK grants uh, in the middle of a pandemic as well, uh, with some further grant funding to match the grant funding um, because of the <laughs> pandemic. So actually, Innovate UK have been excellent. Uh, we're in discussions with ESA about a, a grant for the, for the work that we're doing, uh, which is excellent. And a lot of this is high risk. We're doing things that haven't been done before, and therefore, actually, many of the markets won't give you the, the commercial funding. But also, when they hear that you've got public funding, they see it's de-risked, and then they will give you that funding. To me, the, the great thing about both the combination, because we've also had about half a million of, of, of early sort of pre-seed funding, and we're just going out now to a two million two million pound round, if anyone's interested. Mm. Um, mm. But the, the, the great thing well, for well, me I've... is it allows me to allow the team to spend twice as long on any, on any task. So it's, you know, as an early startup, there's always that, well, let me just build a demo of it. And I don't want to do that, because then when you get to, to the first big client and you try to scale, you got to rewrite everything. So, so actually, having the public funding helps you create a better product from the start. So it's really, it's really that mitigation of risk, isn't yeah. it? That the way the public yeah. source funding really yeah. comes in and helps. Great, yeah. Chris, your man. Uh, yeah. So um, we've gone for a, um, an in Innovate UK grant with a partner. Um, we found it extremely competitive, and um, we got feedback from Innovate UK. We weren't successful, or our partner wasn't successful. Um, but we, we scored 9 out of 10 across everything, um, but we were still unsuccessful, so it's in incredibly difficult to get that funding. We've obviously had some 
local funding as well um, through Aerospace Cornwall, um, which was really great. Um, I, I think that it put us in a position where we, we were able to take the risk of having a team not on a client project. Um, and uh, But the, the cost of that, it was still extremely expensive for us to do that. So it, it just slightly tipped the scales to, so that we can mitigate the risk there. Um, I think that some of the public funding has um, maybe some of the problems um, that I think Nathan was talking about earlier. I, and I don't know if you realize it, and um, apologies, but um, so they, they had some smart line funding. They established a problem that they had. Um, but now it's, um, and then uh, I'm missing what Nathan said earlier. Uh, they, they've got a problem where they want to you know, know about damp in the, in the property. Um, and they've had some funding for it, but now um, it almost sounds like that there's a problem, right? Uh, there's a funded body, but what they really need is an entrepreneur now to um, take that problem, see if it's a, a wider business problem, and really um, develop a business plan on that. And you need someone to put their house on the line <laughs> to see if it's a, a big enough problem to go and do that. Um, and I suppose the way that we mitigate that risk is that um, we're looking for those companies like Shell and you know the, the bigger companies um, to uh, yeah take those 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 risks basically um, to to develop those products. So I get that's how, kind of how we mitigate the risk commercially by um, helping our entrepreneurs um, develop that. Okay. Yeah, good, good. Thanks. And then yeah, finally, Michael. Um, I won't throw a tangent at you this time. <laughs> good, good. Um, funding and investment. Yeah, um, so we're lucky enough to have had, we've run four or five ESA programs, um, had some smaller Innovate UK funding and um, have also received European regional development funding. So we've been through quite a lot of different public funding pots. And my short answer would be, it's about aligning the funding to the, to the, to the project. It's not always, you know, there's a trend in small businesses particularly to go, oh, free money, and sort of jump towards it. But it's not free money at all. Um, and, you know, ESA and other funding pots de-risk your R&D. They allow businesses to build something fantastic, but you need to be careful and be going with your eyes wide open that that funding pot doesn't slow down your innovation because, and Sorry, Andy, you know, ESA can sometimes do that. You know, it, it can it's be. An ad, it's a public body. It's, yeah. Uh, it's uh, and kind of administrative. It's, yeah, it's it can really be a torturous easy. process it's managing an, an ESA not, technical it's manager. Not, it's not as bad as ERDM. No. Oh. <laughs> well, I, didn't I, don't, I don't want to start a punch up, but, <laughs> um, you know, but it's about being pragmatic about, you know, what are, what are you using the funding for and what are you trying to achieve? Um, you know, we've, as a company, we've never received any private investment and that's good and bad. You know, we've, we've definitely bootstrapped our way to where we are now, but it's now uncomfortable and we have to seek private investment if we're going to scale, because then that means we can, you know, do fantastic things without worrying about where the next contract's going to come from. And, you know, we, we were talking earlier about bidding like busy fools. We're, we're, we have been guilty of that, bidding on anything we can get, we can, because actually, if we don't, there's not the cash flow in the company. Private investment unlocks that, public yeah. investment doesn't do that. But if you've got a specific project, something that you believe in, has a good problem, and you just need to de-risk your development on that, that's where public investment is the ticket. Yeah, no, I would completely agree with that. I mean, I'm aware, I used to work for companies, and we used, used to always try and, you know, go after the funding, go after the funding, and always go from one fund to the next, to the next, to the next. It's not sustainable over the long term. So you're dead right. You've got to look at specific, what is your business case? What is your market? How can that money help you de-risk that, that? And I'll be talking about ESA funding in a little while anyway, because um, I've got a, I've got a talk where I'll, I'll walk through that in a little bit more detail. Um, Thanks very much. I will open it. How long have we got? Um, We've got a few minutes left. Like seven minutes. Now. Here we are. So let's we go for some um, questions. Oh, we got lots. Well so yeah. Can we do a couple in here first? Yeah, and I go to the yeah. Slido lady in the green first because I saw you green. saw your hand go up first. <laughs> um, first of all, um, the question on the funding. 
I had this question in my mind okay. um, because I was absolutely amazed that none of you mentioned money as your biggest challenge, mm. how you monetize uh, the products that, that, and, and that you do. I work for the Common Analysis Civil Investment Fund on the equity side, so, so yep. most of the time companies such as yours come to us <laughs> and say, we need, yep. we have this amazing idea and we need funds, this is like some of our equity to prove to the market that they need that as well. Um, so I will go with my next question, uh, which is uh, something that was mentioned early on and it was around regulation and the fact that regulation plays catch up with the current developments. I just want to ask, do you find it as a challenge and how uh, kind of the, the regulatory space maybe affects your different businesses also, for example, there is no standardized um, regulation around like drones, you know, like data mm. around the world. So how the regulatory space actually affects okay. your business and yeah, do you find Good, it good question. Um, I don't know, maybe Anthony? you first and then maybe Chris if you want to yeah it, it, it's interesting the moment you start playing with large organizations like insurers day one they want you to complete 94 documents as one of them did so you know we have an anti-bribery uh, and we have all, all you know you name it the things you never thought you needed as a as a startup so actually from a regulatory point of view we're less affected um, topical subject I was presenting to an insurer yesterday and they said, well, you know, with what's going on in Ukraine, how do you know you'll be able to access satellites in the future? And that starts to wake you up as to, actually, we do need to understand the, the safety of all, all, all of the infrastructures we're starting to use. But, but so far, no, you know, standard data protection type things. Um, we're creating a global solution, and therefore there will be some safe harbor issues where even though we build on Azure, and, and we're using other platforms now as well. Um, some countries will say we want that data to reside in our in in our country. So, as a startup, you're growing up every day. Uh, you're growing up far faster than you'd like to. Um, but uh, today, we're not necessarily seeing that. But we can see some problems in the future. Do you want to just quickly? Well, we well, I was just going to very quickly question. answer your first question. Actually, sorry, I didn't get your name. Hi Anna. Yeah, so so actually, I think the the Cornwall and Silly Fund is um, or Silly House Fund is, is is a great vehicle, right? And I would, and when you talk about risk, often the risk isn't right at the start. It's often when you start to take on more and more contracts and to actually fund that. And obviously, the the Cornwall and Silly House is kind of debt and equity funding, right? So, you know, I see you know as companies grow, in, ourselves included, right? That. Um, taking advantage of, of of that debt funding could very well be a, a very good strategy for someone like a, an Aspiel, and I can't speak for anyone else here, but generally that, that would be a something you would do later on in your company life cycle because it's less, it's more risk averse, I would get, than R&D funding. And it's a bit like ESA in the context that ESA will fund you when you have a, a project and a need, yeah. whereas Space Cornwall is much more for R&D funding. Yeah. I don't know if that helped. Let's, let's go to one uh, question on Slido, and then we go to okay, another so one here. So let's try and answer this quite quick. So this yeah. one's from Bart, and it's more about the data. So it's, given EO is getting more into the realm of private slash personal identifiable data, is there regulation and governance around this, and how does that affect you? Uh, I might not answer the question fully, but it depends where you're operating. So, um, you know, for instance, if you're going to sell, 80% uh, of our work is exported. Um, we do, we have offices in um, Abu Dhabi in the Middle East, because that's where a lot of our clients are. It's a very, you know, the UK has loads of data in new countries like the Emirates. Um, they have no data, but they want to characterize their environments. Now, what they also have generally speaking is quite autocratic governments with some kooky laws that means that we cannot sell directly into those places um, we can't buy imagery of those places and sell and provide products to those places we have to buy through an agent who then gives data back to us and so on that will be true in a lot of different places you'll also have ITAR regulations and things like that in North Africa that you have to be um, compliant with. Would they be able to use Sentinel data? Yeah, sent if you, so you, you, you're you fine with open source okay. data, but that doesn't cut the mustard with yeah. um, the use cases all the time. 
Sentinel's fantastic actually spectrally, but it's you know when you need better spatial resolution, you need to go to a a commercial vendor, mm. and you have to buy through the uh, can get the thing that the King Abdullah Center for Technology and mm. Science or something, and then they give the data to you to process as a value added um, organization. Um, I think the main challenge in individuals and other people accessing high resolution data is getting the business model right from the vendor themselves because a lot of the time it's they're not necessarily set up for they've got minimum orders and things like that they're not set up for you buying little chips of data to then create a service from you have to buy a whole scene or you know and it quickly the business model quickly falls apart um, I think the vendors are working on that but that's when coming to an organization such, a, such as ours who have a relationship with the vendor because we are a reseller in a region or so on, we can have different arrangements with them because we've got an account or someone to, I don't know, I may have waffled through the question there, but. Okay. Let me, let me move, move back into the room. Uh, yeah. Um, my question's slightly different, but um, what, so when I think of AI, I think, you know, future, really advanced, great, it's good in everything, it's awesome. However, when you're trying to commercialise it, uh, to some people, AI as a thing, maybe, you know, you start using words like model, prediction, accuracy, you know, and they, and, and they start thinking, oh, but it's, it's artificial, you know, how can I trust it? Or, um, you know, someone says it's 97% accurate, I think that's amazing, isn't it? but they'll think, well, that means that 3% of the time is wrong. So, um, have you it, find it diff found it difficult to sell the concept of AI to people who may be very, very inexperienced and unaware of it. Um, and if you have, how do you go around handling that and showing that it's a reliable, valuable and advanced um, entity? Yeah, I, if it, I'll just pick that up. Um, so yes, I see that every day because people fear for their jobs. Um, they fear for the change in what they do and the whole transformation. So. I, I, I sort of coin, I, I quote myself, 80% of everything we do as humans are ad, is admin, and less than 20% of our time is spent adding value to our customers or our, our company. And actually, I made it up, but it's actually a true statement, and no one's ever questioned that statement. Yeah. Yeah. And, did, and, and I did ask the question once at a, 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 a big meeting, you know, did anyone ever come into their job to do admin? And actually, one person put their hand up there. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I can never generalise, but, but actually... 80% of everything we do is admin. And so I, I tend to, you know, people will say, will it replace humans and that kind of stuff. I tend to talk about it augmenting people's roles. If, I, if instead of spending two hours reading something, I can spend 10 minutes actually analyzing the data formatted in a good way, then that's far more productive. If I can build a data lake and I can benchmark stuff rather than reading one document after the other and giving up. So. As soon as I talk to people about it augmenting their role, freeing them up to, you know, I don't want, I don't want insurers to be recording risk. I want them to work with people. You know, I, I started the company from, from the background in Intelligent AI, from the background of Grenfell Tower, where no insurer was looking at fire service call-out data. They would just look at a building and go, okay, other than some problems of height, um, you know, we've not seen any claims. Well, half the people didn't even have insurance. So, you know, you've got one world looking at the world one way, and then you've got a world of data another way, and, and it's just, can we augment people's roles so that they can do things more intelligently rather than spending time learning? Good. Do, do you want to add anything? I, 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 I might have one very quick thing, to, to, just to say that AI, I think to your point earlier, I think, Chris, when you said we're not an AI company, we yeah. use AI. Well, in fact, your case, not, not very much, but we, <laughs> use, we use it as a tool. It, it, it's part of that approach. So I think it really boils down to, um, as Anthony said, really, it's about augmenting decision-making or accelerating it. Yeah, I think, I, I mean, I'll add to that as well, that um, if we say to our client that there's... Um, it, we, we use AI to diagnose preemptive pre maintenance. So um, if we say to our client, there's a 97% chance that your um, product is broken right now and needs some maintenance, um, they're pretty happy that they know that it's broken right now and, um, or, or this is wearing out, you need to replace this part. It saves them rather than every six months replacing that part needlessly. They can run it for two years and then it's just about to break, so go out there and 
repair it. So um, yeah, I think that they're they're pretty they're usually pretty happy around that. It it does get into that realm for like a medical device world um, where you're making a diagnosis and, and space as well where you're making like a specific diagnosis that could be life or death for someone. Um, that that's when the uh, w when the the risk sort of ramps up. Um, and then you, you, you have to then weigh up the yeah the risks involved, and part of the regulatory and compliance process is is noting the risk that that the AI plays. I'd just like to pick up on that question as well. Is a lot of what um, the issues around selling AI is very similar to the issues of selling space data in general. It's about managing your clients' expectations because a lot of people are buying. AI, you know, if, if they sit in a government agency, for instance, they're buying AI, they're buying space data because it solves a problem, but they haven't necessarily thought too much deeper than that. And they're expecting it to solve everything. And for us, as being responsible companies, we have to go in and say, actually, no, it's a, as everyone said, it's a tool in the box. It doesn't, it's, it's not as simple as us just going, you know, zoom in, enhance, enhance, enhance. It's actually there are other bits of data we have to consider. It can go so far, but not much further without other inputs of data. And AI is the same, you know, there is a human involved in that. It can do things, but if we say we've trained an algorithm or a machine learning model, it's not just a case of picking up, if it's trained in London and having it work in, you know, um, Vietnam, it, 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 we need, would need to retrain that. And that takes time, it takes risk on the client side and um, it's the same with space data. It can do some things. It can't do everything. Um, but yeah, it's just it's just educating your clients and working with them and being pragmatic and saying, well, we're here to help you solve the problem. Space can do this much. How can we help you go that little bit further? And being pragmatic about that. Can we do one more question. One more question. There we go. Yeah. Um, I just wondered about some costs and skills because obviously part of a really business model you can sell the product but it depends on what it costs you to make it. Um, I'm imagining the main costs of people and data, buying data. Um, I don't know, I'm just I'm asking. Um, and also I was wondering about the skill sets, like are you able to find the skill sets for the team that you need? I, yeah, I mean, so the big, one of the biggest costs for us is actual computation. So the process and the data, because we take data in, for, you know, vast amounts of data in from Central, um, and then we have to process that. So, you know, we, and actually I should have mentioned, actually, we use NVIDIA's A100 platform, the DGX, and a, and a bunch of other cloud platforms which do use NVIDIA technology. But that's a high cost, right, processing their data and it's continuous. So that's a, a hidden cost, and it actually it's, a, it's something that can quite often be a barrier to innovation and taking stuff forward is that's a that's a that's a cost that needs to be thought about deeply um and then in terms of of, of skills yeah absolutely i mean you've only got to look at any report that talks about um skills gap and i think there's a whole you know in order to kind of push things forward it's all about education 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 so you know democratizing the use of ai you can only do by educating people um so the short answer is yep there is computational Power is a cost, um, so having access to, to, to um, a fairly um, priced computational platform is, is good. Um, and yeah, the, um, it, it, it's tough finding good people with subject matter expertise. I think just, just to add to that, the, I actually find that this innovative space is like oxygen to developers and techies, so therefore actually yeah, I, I've run teams before developing bits of software for lift maintenance and, and automotive supply chain and those sorts of things and managing old systems where you're almost you know, tying them to an oar. Actually, I, I find that you can add a lot of value to your company and to your customers, but also to the roles that people are doing when they're getting involved with this innovation. So I actually find it easier to hire people because of the, the sort of, yeah, it's fun. Good. Anybody else like, do you want to pick up on the skills thing, Chris? Or, 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 or? In terms of AI, I think that um, we had to have um, a team stop um, any client work. So there was the cost of them not doing client work, if that makes sense. Um, and 
um, yeah, the cost of the yeah we, that was one of the costs, but that was mitigated through the funding. Um, but also um, now, the more clients that we we get, we have to train more teams. So um, yeah, it's it's mainly a cost around people and training and, and that type of thing. Yeah, I mean, we suffered from a bit of a skill squeeze ourselves. It took us eight months to hire a machine learning engineer. And now we've got one, we're guarding them very closely. <laughs> but it's a case of, it then becomes about making sure that those skills from that person percolate within your organization and that you upskill yourselves. And, um, you know, we're very lucky to have lots of good coders and programmers, but then it's going that step further to getting the really um, skilled data scientists and mm. machine learning engineers and those people who, to work within your company to help you unlock that, to, you know, keep that value in house because, you know, to go back on the cost, the way that our company makes money for via projects is by doing the work in house and not having to outsource it to someone else. That doesn't mean we don't work in partnership because that's actually how we can, you know, satisfy a client to the best of a consortium's ability, but actually if you're outsourcing everything, then actually you're really just a project management company, and that's something that we couldn't survive on. Good. Okay. I think uh, we'll wrap up there. What's what's next? Uh, well, it's break now. Hey. Um, for Fifteen minutes, uh, coffee, and a very nice muffin, apparently. Lovely. And then I'm on after <laughs> that. It's, uh, it's the Andy Williams show. Oh, can't, can't wait. <laughs> right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, good one. Good job, Andy. Is that coming through? One.
Yeah. Cool. <laughs> Excellent. Um, welcome back, everyone. Thank you. So this is the last uh, session. Later, this is now. Anne is going to talk about European Space Agency, the funding and support via ESA as well. And then after that, Ian's doing a few closing remarks and comments on next steps around workshops that are happening. And then there'll be a tour of the site if anyone wants to stay and have a look around the actual site. So over to you. Good. Good. Not quite the graveyard shift. So uh, hopefully I can keep you awake for a little while longer. Okay, yeah, so um, I'm going to talk to you about funding, about European Space Agency funding. Before I did that, I thought I'd do a little aside before I, before I, I, I got going with that. So um, typically when we talk to companies and they say, oh yeah, we don't do anything to do with space, we're not involved in space, I don't really use space applications at all, you know. And then we always go and say, well actually, Everybody uses space applications all the time, you know, and I think everybody in this room knows that, you know, we, we use it when we're driving a car. I use it when I'm walking to places these days. I mean, I'm using Google all the time to try and decide where I'm going. Uh, you know, we're using it when we're looking at the weather applications and looking at what's going on with that. So we're using it all the time. We even use it maybe when we're drinking wine, as I'll, as I'll show you in a bit, you know, so, so all sorts of applications. But I thought I'd choose a day at the end of January when I used it, which is... Uh, there. So I did uh, <laughs> that weekend right at the end of, uh, of, of January, I did the, the ARC 50, which is a ultra marathon down here in, in Cornwall. I started off at the Minac Theatre. I mean, we're down here right now, but I started over there in the Minac Theatre. I ran 50 miles over to Porth Town. Um, yeah, I, I'm still recovering, to be honest. I'm <laughs> busted. I mean, there was, I finished, uh, but I was absolutely knackered by the end of it. But yeah, I just wanted to show that without satellite applications, I'd probably still be there now running. Um, so the first thing is I used uh, a, a tool called Open Tracking, and, and I, I had a GPS receiver on me here. So this is a satellite navigation system here, which is basically monitoring where I am. And so it was for the race organizers to make sure I didn't cheat and jump in a car and, and drive along the A30 to get to the end. That was one. But also my family could follow me on, on an app as well and see how I was getting along and see, see what I was doing. And they actually came to meet me at, at a particular location. That was great. So, uh, so that, that all worked really well. And then uh, also I used... Um, yeah, Ordnance, uh, Ordnance Survey have, a, have an app as well, which uh, I downloaded the, the GPX map of the whole route uh, onto, onto my phone, and I was using it all the time so I wouldn't get lost personally. So all the time I was using it. And, and one particular area, this is the dunes just past, um, uh, just past Hale, um, uh, uh, and, and, and it's just really hard. I got so lost in there, and it was just getting dark, and it was just starting to rain. And I was thinking, what the hell am I doing this for? And then I, uh, I, I, I had to keep on looking at the, at the app, just basically to see which way to go, because you're going through dunes, you're going up and down. So, so to be honest, I think I definitely would still be there if it weren't for satellite applications. So, so satellites really do are, are used all the time. So I thought I'd just give that as a nice example uh, before I got going. OK, so, and yeah, I'm, I am recovered now just... My leg's still a bit dodgy. Anyway, so uh, first of all, European Space Agency. A lot of people think, oh, has that got something to do with the EU? I, I mean, surely we can't be part of that now because the EU is, uh, you know, <coughs> yeah, the UK has, has left the, the EU. But it is a completely different organisation. So UK is still very much still part of the European Space Agency and still provides funding into the European Space Agency. So this means uh, any UK company can still access funding through, through, through the European Space Agency. So this facility here is the, the European Centre for Satellite Applications and Telecommunications. That's in Harwell in Oxfordshire. And so, yeah, so, so ESA, you know, UK is very much still part of ESA. Um, so in terms of what ESA do uh, in terms of business uh, support, I mean, they do a lot of funding and support, what we call upstream, for the development of satellites and, and you know, uh, research and, and sending probes to Mars and things like this. They do a lot of that, but they also provide a lot of business support to companies in, in all sorts of sectors. And it's split into three different areas. There's a technology broker network, which is looking at spinning in and spinning out of technology in, inside the space sector and outside. There's business incubation centers. So there's one in Harwell. And this is all about providing um, 
st support to startups, really, you know, so that's what that is, is, is focused on. So there's a bit of funding available and it's really engaging with startup. And then we have business applications, which is really the area I focus in and where I support. And this is more about providing more substantial funding for commercially focused opportunities and commercially focused uh, uh, projects. So I'm going to be focusing a lot more on that. But within ESA, there's a big, big network across Europe of, of support. And, uh, and of course, you know, uh, that, that includes the UK. Um, so, so to be eligible for, for, for ESA funding, specifically in ESA business applications, I typically go on about three key ingredients. The first one is a commercial focus. So the funding isn't R&D funding. It very much is about looking at commercial sustainability, really what we talked about in that last session, looking at that longer term commercial you know, activity. So it's very much more about uh, um, market pull and not technology push, not about widget building, but what you're going to do with the widget. Customer engagement is, is the next key ingredient and that really links in with the first one. It's all around understanding and having an understanding of your market and having a close relationship with the potential users in that market. And best still, you're, you've already talking and they're interested in what it is you're what what it is you're you're proposing to do. So customer engagement is also very key. And then finally, it is European Space Agency funding. So this one's key. Space must be somewhere in the value proposition of what it is you're offering. It can't be just bolted onto the side. It really needs to be inherent in what it is you're you're, you're offering. And that could be you know usage of satellite comms, usage of satellite use of satellite uh, of earth observation data uh, and other types of so I'll get to that in a little bit more detail so over here you can see the types of space um, technologies that could be considered I mean weather earth observation satellite navigation satellite communication but also uh, even human spaceflight technologies as well and maybe the use of microgravity services in commercial applications so that is is, is considered viable and it's really when you combine some sort of space-based asset together with some sort of innovation that then can provide value into the, to the, to the final market. So, so a perfect example, using Earth observation together with artificial intelligence into you know, the, the healthcare sector, for instance. Yeah? So the, the downstream sector can be any sector you like. It could, you know, I mean, maritime, healthcare, transport, environment, insurance, education etc etc really from ESA's perspective they don't really mind as long as you're somehow using some sort of space-based asset together with some sort of innovation to add value into that sector okay so that is really what we're talking about um, the types of calls available within the ESA framework are really two types there's the open call which is basically open all the time and available for any company an SME a startup or a big you know mid cap large cap um, any particular market sector, as I mentioned, the funding available is typically 50% and then you would then get the other funding either through in-kind contribution or private investment, whatever. And then so people like me come along and help you through that process of, uh, of applying for that funding. And there's two types under that. There's feasibility studies, which tend to be up to about 200k. Again, focusing on commercial feasibility, not really research, you know, and, and looking side of it but looking at commercial feasibility of, uh, of projects and then you have demonstration projects which can be anything up to two million plus if you've got the uh, the capital available you could go for quite a significant amounts of funding the duration typically 12 to 18 months and again this is all around focusing on demonstrating a, a, a particular application if possible together with a client so the client sits in with you and you actually be able to demonstrate the the activity Okay, there are also then theme calls, and I'm going to go through in a little while, I've got a bunch of theme calls that I'll, I'll present, which are focused on particular market sectors. Um, they're not always open to all uh, ESA delegate countries. So, so for instance, in, in particular case, the UK has to say, yes, I want to fund that one, and then the UK then it's open to UK companies. And they're typically available periodically for two to three months although some are long term they're open for 12 months or longer and there are two types there there's kickstarters which are usually 75 percent funded but maximum 60k euro 
and they look at kick-starting new services and applications. And then demonstration and feasibility studies are, are coming out of those, which are the same as these, but specifically, you know, uh, you know, looking at a particular themed sector, such as health or whatever. Um, so, words on the funding. Um, the funding comes from the national. So for, for us in the UK, that comes from the UK Space Agency. So the UK Space Agency is holding the purse strings. ESA run the framework, but UK actually uh, uh, provide the money. And like I said, the private investments, client support, which is fantastic if the client engages and they have put money in or in-kind contribution. And this is quite an interesting thing to know as well. The contracts through ESA are done as commercial contracts. So they procure it as a commercial contract through a firm fixed price. So there's milestone payments as you go through. So this is so much better for small companies than grants, because typically with grants, you you spend the money, you show that you've spent the money, and then you claim the money back. And it's it's quite administratively heavy, as I mentioned earlier. You know, for, for, I've run an ERDF project before, and it was hard work to actually do all the claim management and things like this. So all of that is removed because it's all done via milestones. And it's uh, it, actually, it might be worth mentioning, the Goon Hilly 6 project was done like this. So it could have very been easily done as a grant, which would have caused Ian a lot more hard work and, and, and sleepless nights because it just would have been hard work to deal with. Whereas instead it was done through ESA as a commercial contract. And I think Ian, you would agree it was it was just a lot better that way from a commercial. Half as many sleepless nights, there we go, how about that? So I think that one itself is a really useful thing to know actually. Yeah. Um, so in terms of the process, there's, uh, there's an activity pitch questionnaire, which is you, you need to fill in first, which is an eight page questionnaire, which doesn't ask you questions like, what is your widget and how does it work? It asks you questions like, well, what is the market? You know, what value are you adding to the market? Things like this. So it's very much business case focused. And then that goes to ESA. ESA make a decision whether they'd like to put you forward. Then you go through an outline proposal phase and then a full proposal phase. The whole process um, can take, it's, it's typical institutional funding, you know, it does take a while, you know, that's the issue, as, 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 as a couple of people know this, so, uh, but yeah, it can take six months for the whole process to go through, and sometimes longer, uh, but, but, you know, the fact of the matter is that the money that you get is, is, is equity free, so they're not they're not asking for IP out of it, you know. So what m money you receive is is then yours to actually use. I think that's quite valuable that they're not then saying, oh yeah, we want a share of the IP because of it. Um, I'm going to give you an example. This is my my nice example I like to give, which is a, a, the tractor, because um, this is a, an example of a. a, a a valid business application. So here we go, we've got a nice tractor. And this one is great because it does tick all three boxes. It's commercially focused, customer engaged, the customers here are, you know, the farming community, the agriculture community. But the third one, what satellite assets would a tractor use? And so I wanna just talk you through this because this is a bit of an intelligent tractor. So first things first, it uses, as, as a service, it uses earth observation data because it uses that to monitor the crop health and to know when to go out and actually go to a particular th field. It also uses satellite navigation, precise navi satellite navigation to know exactly you know, where, which, which line to go down, when to turn, when to come back. So it's also therefore using satellite navigation to, to, to provide the service if it do, that it does. And finally, it's in the middle of nowhere and there's no 4G service where it is um, uh, and no terrestrial communications. So it actually uses satellite communications to access the data in the cloud to, to send and receive uh, the, the information that it needs. So this is a really nice example because it's actually using three different space-based assets in delivering the service that, it, that, it's, that it's giving. So I think that one's quite, quite you, you get the impression of what this is all about. Uh, I've got some real examples here. Uh, this one is all around uh, forestry and there's been a few, you know, we've talked already today about the, the use of earth observation in monitoring um, fields. And here's a commercial application here where they're, they're using, they've used, uh, you know, satellite uh, uh, 
yeah, well, earth observation data in, 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 in forestry and forestry management. So that, that actually got funded and actually was a delivered project for, for the European Space Agency. But my favourite is this one, and it comes back to what I mentioned earlier, drinking wine. Who'd have thought you're drinking wine and you're using a space-based application while you're drinking your wine? But this was a company that basically used earth observation data again to monitor uh, the, the crops uh, and, and the vineyards. Uh, and, and again, this was a funded project through the European Space Agency. There was probably you know, some French people involved in the decision uh, to, to fund this and thought, hello, we'll have a bit of that. <laughs> Vino sat, I loved it. <laughs> so it just shows you, you know, there is different types of applications. And as long as you can hit those three key ingredients, commercialization, customer focus, and space in the value chain, you know, you've got a good chance of getting funded. Yeah, so I think that's... Uh, and, and uh, the URL there, you can go in and have a look at that. And there's a bunch of projects that are in there that have been funded, both from the UK and, and elsewhere within Europe. Um, so now I'm going to talk about the themed calls. These are, uh, if you remember that box diagram I showed earlier, the, the ones over on that far side. Um, so we've got some short-term calls which are all open at the moment or coming, com, uh, uh, coming along quite soon. Um, this one, carbon capture stor storage and sequestration, that, that one is a Kickstarter, but it closes on the 26th of March. But you can see the type of idea here. This is all around sustainable environment, you know, environmental sustainability and how you can use, you know, space-based assets to support that. So that's something that ESA are very keen on. Um, digital supply chain is an interesting one. It's really looking at, you know, the, the movement into sort of supply chains in, in industries and how they're going digital and how space-based assets, whether it's Earth observation data or satellite communications or even, you know, satellite <laughs> navigation, tracking assets, you know, there's different ways in which satellite can help the supply chain. So this one is open um, till May. Uh, space and digital transformation into green energy utilities. I mean, it says it on the tin, but it's really looking at ways in which space-based assets can support um, green energy. Uh, space application supporting digital transformation in public safety. This is another one focusing around uh, emergency services and anything related to public safety, how space-based assets can support those. Um, so those are short-term calls. Over there, we've got longer-term calls, which are all being open uh, or, or coming open and then staying open for a while. NHS Future Hospitals Initiative is really looking at ways in which space can can support, you know, the hospital environment and the and and the uh, specifically that's for the UK because it's an NHS. Space for tourism again, looking at ways in which space-based assets can support. Um, a nice example that the councillor mentioned earlier is monitoring monitoring beaches you know I mean when are the beaches really when, when the beaches are full maybe that's something that we could look at so they're, they're really looking at all sorts of ideas here um, space for uh, safety uh, and security space for rail these are very long open calls but basically open to any ideas in those particular sectors and then finally this this one at, at the bottom is an interesting one so this is commercial applications enabled by space environments this is actually looking at uh, utilizing space in space. All these others are all looking at utilizing space on the ground in particular, gra 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 you know, um, earth-based sectors. This one at the bottom is really looking at, say, using microgravity services for commercial applications. So, for instance, pharmaceutical industry. How can the pharmaceutical industry use microgravity to uh, enable some experimentation that is commercially useful for, for the pharmaceutical industry? So that, you know, it's, it's really looking at ways in which you can use the space environment to do commercial applications. So, Typically, when we're going up to the space station, it's all for research, you know, so when astronauts are going up to the, to the space station, they're very much focused on research. What they're starting to look at now is how can we use the space environment for commercial exploit, you know, for, for commercial applications. So that one's, uh, that one's open as well. So that's the list of the current calls, but you can see that the, the variety is quite wide, you know, there's a lot of opportunity through European Space Agency for funding in any, you know, this just gives you an, a, an idea, but there's, a, there's loads of other ideas in loads of other sectors where space can add value. So I think that that's just gives you an idea. So um, that's me down the bottom there. I cover the Southwest uh, and South Wales. 
I've got my other um, very handsome colleagues there that are, that are dotted around the, the country. Uh, and we basically support pretty much the whole of the UK. And then there's other ambassadors that cover the rest of Europe as well. Um, and we, yeah, we're, 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 we're there to support any company that are interested in bidding into this uh, to help them through the process. Um, I think I'm nearly done. This is an interesting, this is just, we picked up uh, the themes from the different regions that are, that are you know, because in each region there's different things that are of, of more interest. If you look down in our area, it's things like, you know, tourism is there, but maritime and aquatic, um, wildlife and, and, and environment, um, space-based infrastructure is there now. You know, when you look at different areas, you know, you, you start to see different types of topics come up because they're more interesting for those particular, uh, th those particular areas. So that was quite, a, quite an interesting thing to see. Um, yeah, so that's me uh, basically finished. This is the this is the support that you, know, you get through 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 the team. Um, I think uh, yeah, that the network is pretty significant once you get funding, and the fact that you can utilize the branding. Then the ESA branding is actually quite powerful as well because you know you go out then to look for future funding or commercial exploitation. You say I've actually done something through ESA. That's uh, quite um, there's a bunch of URLs over in the corner, and that's me. So, uh, yeah, please uh, don't hesitate to get in touch with me through, through LinkedIn. Um, before I finish, I do want to also put a shout out to the Southwest Centre uh, of Excellence. So, Conrad, I don't know if you can wave your hands. Yeah, so Con Conrad runs the Southwest Centre of Excellence, which is also hosted through University of Exeter. And Conrad and the team are really there to offer additional support as well for any business that is interested in, in getting involved in, in, in space applications, either upstream or downstream, as I, as I mentioned. Uh, Conrad is also there to, to, to help. And there is a particular event that's coming up quite soon that I think, Devi, you were going to mention. So De Devi's yeah, on his team. Andy. about the uh, space commercialization engine. So looking at uh, if businesses have something that they want to commercialize, they're not sure how to do it, then there's a support program offered, being offered by the Catapult to do that. So that'll be Tuesday 29th, and I, we can just announce some details. That. And that's Penryn Campus in New Falmouth. Okay. There we are. That's me, that's me done. So um, open to questions. Question. Um, so if you UK, you've got a funding chance of these people. 5% chance of being successful, what's it with ESA? It's a really good question because the, 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 the pot of money is there to be had. <laughs> you know, it's, uh, you know you're, you're not, with the open call, you're not really in competition. If they like the idea, you've got a very good chance of getting funded. So if you can hit those three key ingredients and you can get that across really well, so commercial focus, so you've got a strong business case. Customer engagement, you've got customers that are willing to get engaged. Maybe you've got letters of support from those customers that say, we really like this idea, we want to be involved. And then you can show that space is very much part of the value chain in what it is you're offering. Then, then it's also, there's, a, there's a good... The, the, the good thing is, is the initial sort of um, gate is just an eight page questionnaire. So you do that eight page questionnaire, you get that in. If, you, if, that, if that is liked and you get through and, and, and get to present uh, and pitch the idea, the chances after that, I think are, are really high. Well over 50% into the, you know, 90. That's so the thing. Yeah, if you can get over that first, APQ, the eight pages, then well on your way. Brilliant. Is anyone else? Hi. I just wanted to add that um, Ezrin, so that's what the SCAT is, um, Earth Observation Centre at ESA, um, work with us for, for frontier development. Ah, lovely. So there is this funding um, available through that in the sense of all of the stakeholders involved in FDL. Um, but 
and Vidi does have, um, so we'll, we'll provide hardware and um, financial support to academics. So any academics that are working um, with commercial entities, and that could either be ESA or it could be um, because if you're funneling through a startup, we've got other programs. But if you are working um, on anything using GPUs and AI, um, we can provide hardware and donations, um, financial donations, and it's all through the website. Just look up yeah. ARAP. I, th I think as well through through because that's Frascati, so that's in Italy where they where they, where, the, where Ezrin is, yeah, and I yeah. think also through the business applications program, which is the one I mainly talked about. Sats, I, space um, space apps support. Uh, sorry, Satan. Yeah, is, is part of it. Ah, uh, okay, but but through business applications, I think there's also the potential to get AWS credits as well. So I, I'm yeah. I, I'm pretty sure folk have done that before. So successful. Applicants on this program have gone on to get AWS if credit. We don't grant actual GPUs, and there's not many around at the moment. Yeah. Um, it's yeah, through the cloud um, credits and AWS are, um, are normally um, quite handy with, uh, with the amount of credit. Um, but we work with Google Cloud and mm. yeah, the, the yeah. major clouds anyway. The so. major cloud, yeah. Okay. Anyone have more questions? Heidi? Yeah, so because this is more, um, let's say, commercially focused rather than R&D, they tend to like the TRL already to be relatively high. So I, I roughly, I would say sort of four-ish. But, you know, there's no, there's no specific statement that it must be at this level. You know, if you're able to get across those three key ingredients, because you can do those feasibility studies where you're looking at the commercial feasibility of a, a potential solution where the TRL might be lower. But the focus there is not spending the money on developing the, the, the R&D on the technology. You're spending the money on understanding the commercial feasibility of a, of a solution. But I would say typically the TRL that they're looking at is, is at the higher end. Yeah, I would say that's still valid. Yeah, that's still valid. I mean, if, I'm just thinking now of my three key ingredients and you still tick all three boxes because you're showing a commercial growth of what it is you want to do. As long as you're adding value through space, you know, that third key ingredient I mentioned, you know, the, as long as you're able to demonstrate that space is helping you to deliver value to the, to the proposition that you, you're okay. doing. Expanding. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Brilliant. Well, I think that's it then. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andy. <laughs> You're up. Brilliant. Well, that's all the, the main speech. I'm just going to hand over to Ian now to close it. Close today, but thank you very much for everyone for coming. Uh, over to you, Ian. Very good. Well, thank you, everybody. Um, I haven't really got a lot more to, to, to add to today. I think it's been really a really brilliant day. I need to have been nervous this morning. Um, and uh, I just really uh, just wanted to say everybody who's contributed uh, and has come a long way to, uh, to, to, to contribute and be here today. Thanks to Aerospace Cornwall. Uh, and, and the team, and to Olivia, who's still in the background somewhere. She's, she's on the screen here uh, for, for all the hard work that she she, she put in, and, and the team from Halo as well have been supporting us. Um, so, so thank you to you all, and, and obviously uh, for, for everyone who um, who came along today. Our, so we're going to have a follow up. We're going to have a workshop, and uh, I can't really read out. Um, being superstitious here, the um, dates, but you know, the Ides of March and all that. Um, but uh, we're we're going to follow up with a with a workshop. Um, we will post out to everybody who attended uh, by email um, the the details of that. Everybody would will, will be welcome. We'd like to delve in in, in a more practical sense uh, to some of the questions we 
uh, we raised today uh, and uh, just get, get your feedback. We'd be really interested in everybody's feedback, whether it's online or, or um, whether you've been here uh, um, present in person. Uh, and we'll use that to inform the, the workshop. But we'll, as I say, all the details of all the people who've been involved we'll, we'll post on, um, on, on the live web, which we'll, we'll actually do an edit of uh, uh, so, so that uh, we've cut out all the breaks and things. So, um, so I think that's the end of the live stream. So thank you for that. And for those people who are left here now, um, uh, don't feel you need to 